If beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder, what does the vision see? Man reincarnates as vision in the MCU. What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in the MCU as Vision. Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. The three of them appeared in a barren expanse of land so fast that no one noticed how they traveled, but only when they arrived. Um, sis, where the hell are we? Petro questioned curiously after his hub couldn't track his current location to any coordinates on Earth's geography. I'm having a feeling that this isn't as good vision chimed. Wanda rolled her eyes and ignored the boys as they looked around, while she crouched down and studied the remains of the magic circle that brought them here wherever the hell here was. Got anything? Vision asked, but she shook her head. Even if the spell failed, I'm sure I should have been able to identify the mistakes, but I can't see any. She held her hand out, and Vision pulled her up, meaning the spell worked, at least in the capacity I made it. But since we're clearly not in Asgard and given that we used Thor as our marker, this place should be related to him in a way. Either it means something to him or he came here recently through the Bifrost. Increasing his eyesight as much as he could, Vision failed to see anything apart from an outstretched plane of barren ground. Warning, oxygen levels are a little bit below that of Earth. Extended exposure to humans might lead to asphyxiation, delirium, lung failure, etc. You guys might want to protect yourself. The oxygen here is a bit lacking. And there's something else in the air. Vision informed. Wanda flicked her hand and was covered by a red glow for a brief moment before it disappeared. While Petro tapped the lightning motif on his shirt, and the collars generated a thin film. That covered his head and stuck to his skin. Figures. No wonder I felt a bit trippy. The speedster noted. Any ideas on figuring out where the hell she spirited us to? He asked, pointing at Wanda. How about you try running a circumference around us? Vision suggested. Sure. Radius. Try anywhere between 500 kilometers to 1,500 kilometers. That's quite the distance, but no biggies. With a reminder to report anything he sees, Petro disappeared in a silver streak, leaving a plume of dust showering on Vision and Wanda. That insufferable idiot. Wanda cursed her brother as Vision cleared the dust with a wave of his hand. Should we wait for him? Vision shook his head. Since you're pretty sure that this planet had some sort of connection to Thor or his recent whereabouts, let's see if we can find anything. She agreed with his reasoning, and they both took to the air. Should we split up? She asked. But Vision saw no need for them to split up. Petro will cover more ground than us, so let's just take our time until he gets back. They picked a random direction and flew towards it at breathtaking speed, but still slow enough for them to note the surface below them. They had flown for a little over 15 minutes, when Petro's message of finding signs of settlement and vegetation came in. Wanda portaled them to Petro's location by using her bond with her brother as a beacon. What they arrived at was the remains of a small city wrecked to the ground by a large-scale battle. Probably war, Petro remarked. And based on soot marks and the clouds around, I'd say it happened a little over a week ago. Well, you're not wrong about that. Vision commented as he scanned the burnt woods lying around. Let's pick up the pace. I think we'll find the survivors if we follow that path. With that, he and Wanda once again took to the sky, while Petro ran below them, while matching his pace with theirs. They came across a few smaller settlements in the same state as the first, but they didn't stop and soon came across a small town that was currently on fire while being besieged by a race of flaming creatures. Should we step in? Wanda asked with a heavy frown on her face. I don't see a reason not to. It's unlikely that our intervention is putting an end to a justified war. But oh well. Is there any such thing as a justified war? You'd be surprised, Vision said. Vision left Wanda and Petro to take care of fire slaughter that was happening below them, while he kept an eye on the surroundings. Seeing their numbers being reduced at a threatening rate, one of the bigger fiery attackers shouted, and the ones that were quick enough melted into the ground with a form of magic and disappeared. The residents of the half-destroyed town, despite being wary of the new arrivals, expressed their gratitude in words that only Vision could understand due to his connection with the Mind Stone. Wanda could read their general intent, so she wasn't as clueless as Petro. 
who just stood there awkwardly. The residents continued packing their things to run away, since they weren't sure when next those creatures would come. Vision engaged one of the indigenes and requested for any useful information. Do you have any idea where they came from? He asked in fluent alien speak. Demons from the fiery depths. We received word a few days ago that a few villages far east was burnt to the ground. But we thought whatever it is was far from us. The four-eyed alien said. It's not like they could just up and leave on news that happened over 700 kilometers away from them. What about any news of help? Any military station near here to react in the event of an invasion? The man shook his head. We are too far away from the mainland. There were words however that some Issa and Asgardian warriors have been seen stopping some outbreaks up north. I heard the son of the sky is with them. A shame that they aren't here when we need them. Vision left the dejected man alone after getting the information he needed. Turning to Wanda and Petro, he gave the former thumbs up. Looks like you were right. Thor was last seen in the north, but that's probably outdated information by now. Petro hummed. I can scout ahead for any signs of him or his last seen location. With his strength and the Bifrost at his disposal, it won't be surprising if he's already on the other side of the planet. That's true. I'll see if I can pick up his energy as we move. With that, they once again set off in their search for the Nordic God, while swiftly putting an end to any invading battles they came across. With Petro's speed and Wanda teleporting herself and Vision to his location once he came across anything, they quickly covered a great distance in 12 hours between short stops for the Maximoffs to rest and saving burning settlements they came across. This planet is definitely bigger than Earth, and the scorching sun that's been up there since we arrived isn't helping. Wanda complained. I estimate its size to be at least over half that of Jupiter. Vision gave his calculated guess while causing Wanda to groan louder. That's already half a dozen times the size of Earth. Came in Petro's relieved voice. Wanda didn't wait another second, and immediately opened a portal that swallowed them and crossed them to his location. In the distance, they could hear the booms and see little lights of blue lightning sparks, as Thor controlled his lightning in the crowded city turned battleground. Well, let's go say hi, Petro said and was the first to zoom off towards the ongoing battle. He cleared the few stragglers around Thor, taking the latter by surprise until he realized who it was. The young speedster. It's so good to see you, Peter. How are you here on Gorag? He exclaimed. It's Petro and I came with my sister and Vision. Petro said and pointed behind Thor at the incoming duo he just mentioned. Allies of yours, Thor. A loud gruff voice from a huge, tall, red-haired and thick-bearded man wielding a two-edged axe called out to Thor. Oh, these are some of my friends from Midgard that I told you about. He paused the introductions and stretched his in the direction of one of the Hellspins, and the hammer he had thrown a few seconds ago traveled back to his hands by blasting a hole through the body of the Hellspin. Some of the warriors took notice of their arrival, but paid no more attention to them. Vision lasered through a few of them as he landed and phased through the one that tried attacking him from behind, only for it to lose its head without Vision making contact with it. Their display of strength quickly gained the attention of the entire battlefield, especially Vision who fought just as exaggerated as Thor in terms of destructive capabilities. Wanda was paid less attention to as she wasn't the only sorcerer here, as there were quite a few Issa, a race gifted with talent in magic, present. Petro however took it easy this time and just zapped around the field, getting the civilians to safety, while destroying any hellspin in his way. As they fought against the largest wave of hellspins they've come across, Vision inquired from Thor. What deal did the hellspins have against the people of this planet? It's not just this planet, Vision. The Nine Realms and the universe at large is being besieged by forces of darkness. Thor swatted an hellspin away with a backhand, and it dug up a trench. He then jumped into the middle of a group of hellspins, and threw his hammer at the one in front of him. The hammer circled around him with a trail of lightning, destroying everything around him. These are flame demons, creatures of fire and destruction from the pits of Muspelheim, under the service of the demon Serta, ruler of Muspelheim. Forming a chain scythe with hard light, vision cleaved through the flame demons, in a mastery display of weaponry no one had even seen him use. While he was comfortable being a purely destructive type of fighter, he also excelled expertly when it came to ranged fights with weapons. Switching between weapons from no staffs to nunchunks, or with a bladed edge, Vision tore his way through the army of flame demons. What he didn't count on however, was stoking the competitive spirits of the battle-loving race, who pressed harder on with morale-lifting roars, increasing their ferocity, as well as the time they took in clearing the small army of flame demons. 
As they were killing the last few stragglers remaining, the ground started rumbling before it exploded with a sea of flames, and from the now flaming landscape crawled out a giant flame demon. It stood 18 meters tall and held a flaming club. Oh, it's a big one this time. I'll have this one, Thor said and broke off into a sprint towards the flame demon, while furiously spinning his hammer so fast that it started generating crackling arcs of lightning around it. The flame giant felt the danger Thor was emitting, and broke off in large leaps towards the Asgardian god. The sky darkened and rumbled as Thor drew close to the giant. He leapt over the giant, causing it to stumble as if forcefully swing its club. Flying over the giant's head, Thor raised his hammer to the sky, and the sky replied him by raining down streaks of lightning. That clinged fiercely to his hammer, as he brought it down on the giant's head. From afar, it looked as if Thor was drawing down ropes of lightning from the sky, and striking the giant with it. At the moment of impact, a bright white light blinded the entire battlefield for a few seconds. And when it cleared, Thor was standing on a glassy ground, with the only thing left of the giant being the huge club it wielded as its entire body was obliterated under Thor's might. This will make for a nice spoil to my collection. He chuckled as picked up the charred club, a bit surprised that it survived his attack. His reveling was however put to a stop by the complaint of a woman clad in slim armor with flowing black hair, possessing a fierce beauty lady Sif, a longest time friend of Thor, and a comrade in arms. Don't you think that was a bit excessive? You didn't need all that to kill that giant. Thor just shrugged and held the giant club over his shoulders, and hooked his hammer to his waist, sporting a comical sight with the club he carried. I didn't know it was that weak. You know, sometimes I forget that bigger doesn't mean stronger. Of course it doesn't you oaf. Seth said in annoyance. Even now she could still see a few people staggering to balance their vision after Thor's stunt. So... Who are your friends here? Smiling as he walked towards where Vision and the Maximoff twins were standing, he dropped the hammer and drew in Wanda and Vision into a hug, while Petro expertly dodged. They are warriors from Midgard, the finest of the realm. Peter over there is gifted with divine speed like Hermes. And Wanda over here is a witch, a good one. She messed with our minds when we first met and almost made us turn against ourselves. Ah, those were good times. The people listening looked on with uncertainty at Thor, as he narrated Wanda's first altercation with the Avengers, with a nostalgic look on his face, making the young witch awkward as she saw the raised brows directed her way. And this is Vision, he said as gave a warrior's shake to the human-looking android. Honestly, I don't know what he is, but he is a great warrior. One even the Allfather will consider worthy. My friends, what brought you endless stars away from Midgard? Wanda and Petro looked at Vision, the latter because he had no idea and was dragged along in a freak accident while the former because she just went along with finding a spell. After he said he wanted to look for Thor, Vision waved his hands indicating that it was nothing serious. I was just experimenting with a way we could use to contact you and check in with you while at it. But that aside, this looks like a bigger deal. Thor grimaced and a seriousness came over his face, as he looked at the destroyed part of the city where they fought. You know not how right you are. It's like everyone is in an arms race after news of an infinity stone surfacing somewhere in the universe. Planets are being raised to the ground in conquest. And while Asgard has no interest in wars that are happening outside of the realms under its protection, the demons of Muspelheim felt like it was time to start their carnage across the Nine Realms, and those under it. Sif added as she joined Thor, along with the Warrior Three following alongside her. I now father has us running all over the realms to put out the fires they started. If only he let us march into Muspelheim and put Serta to rest once and for all. Thor said grimly and looked at his hands. Though I doubt I'd fare well in a battle against an ancient demon like the Lord of Flames. At least you're not being delusional. Volstig, the huge red-haired man, remarked. I've read a bit about Asgardian mythology, and Surtur's re-emergence is always tied with the coming of Ragnarok. Is that what's happening? Wanda asked which further darkened Thor's face, and cast shocked looks on that of Sif and the Warrior Three. They looked at Thor and seeing his silence, received the admission they didn't want, and their expression copied his dark look. Rather than think of something that only the Allfather can comprehend, how about we try to put a stop to the invading fire demons on this planet? No use worrying about things outside of your capabilities. Vision suggested, his words having the intended effect as it redirected the Asgardian warrior's mind to what was important in the current setting. You are right, Vision. I'm not as wise as my father, 
but I am strong, so I'll do what is asked and expected of me. Thor casted aside his worries and unhooked his hammer. Let's drive those flaming demons back to the pits they crawled out from, and we'll have a feast after that for yet another crusade one. Ha ha ha. That's a prince. Volstig laughed loudly. Vision, Wanda, Peter, will you lend me your strength? Vision chuckled at Thor's request. Of course we would. You have done much more for us. And besides, helping people in need is the reason why we fight. I couldn't have said it better. Sif nodded in appreciation of Vision's honorable sentiments. Ha ha ha. You're right. Heimdall, we're ready. A bright light tore a hole through Gorag's sky and covered all the Asgardian and Issa warriors before disappearing. In another location on the same planet, the Bifrost light crashed into the ground and receded back into stars in the next moment, while leaving the warriors of Asgard, Vanaheim and Midgard in its wake. Where the Bifrost walked them to was a temple erected to Odin and a few Asgardian gods. Thor's rage at the desecration of a temple erected to Odin and the deities under him caused loud booms of thunder to cry across the sky. Vision nodded at Wanda, and together they both took off towards the demons along with the others. Using Thor as a lightning rod, Vision drew down lightning from the sky and obliterated the demons he was targeting. Wanda muttered a spell, and magic circles came to life around her hands, and the demonic Hydra was once again summoned. Unlike the first time she summoned it, or gave it life, each of its heads looked more alive, and two of them were even made up of lava, while some of the others exhibited elemental attributes. Eat, devour, and come back stronger. The Hydra's head all hissed and slithered towards the flaming hot demon buffet spread out for them. Who the hell are these guys? Fandral, one of the three, exclaimed as he saw Vision and Wanda steamrolling the demons with the same ease that Thor did. Each exaggerated and thorough in their attacks. Vision POV thankfully for us. Thor and his group had been clearing a lot of the demon-infected areas weeks now, and they started their extermination crusade on Gorag two days back. So we had fewer places to hit, and spent less time in each location. Me and Wanda teaming up with Thor against the flame demon was an overkill already waiting to happen. Add Petro into that, and it's a steamroll of the disrespectful kind. He had a habit of being casual on the battlefield which I think comes from the fact that very few could keep up with him when he moves. His help in bailing any warrior being pressed down was an immense contribution that reduced the death toll on Thor's side to zero after we joined in. Another thing about the Asgardians I noticed was that they were super soldier level of strength to varying degrees. Fandral was definitely faster than Steve, and Volstig was just as strong as the improved Steve. The other two, Hogan and Sif, with their spiked mace and sword respectively, were experts in the mastery of their weapons. The four of them were definitely peak warriors when it comes to combat. So good that nobody I've seen on Earth comes close to them when it comes to weapon mastery. I guess that these are the expected results when they've had centuries to a millennium to hone their fighting capabilities. That's the last of them. One of the Ainajar came and reported what was the end of our crusade on this planet. Fun fact about the planet called Gorag. It has 50 hours in a day, and 15 of those cover the entire day while the remaining 35 hours is unforgiving torture of their huge shining bright sun. So, Thor what now? I asked him. Heimdall will bring us back to Asgard in a few minutes where there's a banquet waiting, and I'll introduce you to my father. Thor said with practiced ease. This definitely wasn't the first time he's done something like this. I thought outsiders weren't allowed in Asgard. I asked with a bit of concern. He on the other hand casually waved any concerns I might have had. My father probably. Certainly, definitely knows that you are my trusted friend. If he didn't want you on Asgard, he would have sent me a message. And that was another evidence that this universe alternate of the mainstream timeline I knew. The similarities between them were glaringly almost identical. But small yet major changes like these make the differences apparent. In other words, Odin is not on deathbed. And I might possibly meet a version that's more comic-oriented. And that is an Odin I'd try my best to avoid any type of altercation with. It's about time, Heimdall. I looked at the sky at Thor's words, and could see it swirling before the light engulfed us, and forcefully pulled us through spatial points. The information I gleaned from this few seconds of travel was so big that I just forgot about it. This was pure magic, runes, the roots of a primordial tree, and topped with energy from the space stone. I might figure something out if I go through it a couple of times, but that's a request I have no intention of voicing to either Thor or, God forbid, Odin. If I had been truly human, I would have been wrecked with nervousness like Wonder and Petro. But instead, all that came to me was paranoid cautiousness and escape plans. And neither of those looked good. 
Probability of surviving a confrontation with Asgard's Allfather based on existing information and conjectures 0% combat, or provoking a negative reaction from the Allfather, is strongly advised against I already knew this. But having my own processor throwing it in my face after basing it on my own knowledge regarding Odin, didn't feel reassuring. My eyes scanned the dome of the Bifrost and studied the figure standing on the highest platform in the middle of the dome. He was tall, over 9 feet and a half, fitted in golden armor. That only left the area around his eyes open for people to see. His eyes were golden with tiny dotted illuminances facing around in his eyes. We both looked at each other for a second or two, before he moved his head towards Thor, after greeting us with a welcome. I also noticed that he didn't blink throughout the whole thing, not even once. How is it Heimdall? Thor asked and claimed the platform to stand with Heimdall, who was now looking at the black expanse of space. The forces of Muspelheim have retreated back to the crevices of their realm, thanks to your effort, my prince. He said with a slight bow. But it's temporary, is it not? Affirmative, my prince. But I reckon they'll stay put for a little while to build up a larger attacking force. After all, their groups were hunted down, meaning a bigger target, but without the surprise factor. Thor interjected to which the tall guardian nodded. I'll meet with father before the banquet and notify me of any other attacks, Muspelheim forces or not. Thor said and climbed back down and started directing us outside of the dome. Welcome to my home, hidden beyond the brightest stars, Asgard. My honest reaction was that it was easily the most magnificent place I've ever seen, and even the logical part of me couldn't help but be impressed, especially with the pure gold structure of the Asgardian royal palace. That stretched up to the clouds. Oh, dot just wow. It's breathtaking. Wanda gasped in amazement of the beautiful city in front of us. While gold wasn't used in building every single structure except the palace, gold was incorporated into every single building to some degree, either designed into the pillars or even the doors. Come on, let's not dawdle longer. He spun his hammer and shot straight at the palace, while beckoning us to follow. Are there no rules against visitors flying straight to Odin's court? I asked the warrior three who were preparing to board a flying ship. Fandral answered, There are, but since Thor waved it for you, you don't have to worry. We followed soon after and caught up with Thor who just landed, seemingly speaking to a guard. Unfortunately, Father is currently busy with his generals, which means he'll meet us at the banquet if he feels up to it. Thor explained and led us through a few large doors to arrive at a hall. Make yourself comfortable. The others will be here soon. Damn man, your crib is so dope. Petro exclaimed, still in wonder at Asgard's grandeur. I would have been behaving the same if I didn't have a perfect active control over my emotions. I don't know what that means, but thanks. He grabbed a gourd on the table we sat around and poured each of us a drink. So, how has Midgard been? Not another calamity threatening the planet I hope. Well, this is a nice brew. More potent and intoxicating than most of what you'll find on Earth. We've been alright, a few hiccups here and there, but mostly alright. At least until the next big psycho, I replied. By now the hall was slowly getting crowded, and Thor's four friends were sitting with us, wine in one hand and meat in the other. How about your quest concerning information on the stones, any luck? I'm not that fixated on the infinity stones. I mean I wouldn't be if I had another choice. Unlike people like Wanda Petro, Thor and even Bruce, my potential cap is strictly limited if I am to pursue strength on my own. Like I did with Kang's armor by fusing with it or using the Mind Stone to copy abilities that are biological and scientific in nature, it's hard for me to grow stronger. Unless I fuse with a Celestial's armor or the Infinity Stones, while extremely powerful, it's still not sufficient. At best, by maxing out what I currently have, I'll be a planet buster. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean much in the power scale, as even the X-Men have up to five planet busters on their roster, once they learn how to use their abilities well. Other than rumors and a few gossips going around, I have no concrete evidence after all this while. Thor said in an irritated but calm way. I noticed when we met back on Gorag, but Thor's a lot calmer now than I remembered him being. No, not calmer. More composed, balanced in the way he carries himself. What kind of rumors? Wanda asked. Apparently an intergalactic conqueror by the name of the Mad Titan is hunting for the stones. He had a clash with the Nova Empire a month back. Multigalactic power. Yes. Thor nodded and continued feasting on the sumptuous spread in front of us with a warrior's veracity. He took a large gulp directly from a gourd and banged it on the table after finishing its content. There's a rumor however that had been circulating recently from a few weeks back. 
but I have no way of confirming if it's true, or if it's simply just another baseless rumor. Thor choked out with a slight uptick to his voice as he forsook the meat, and went for a purple apple instead. I took my time in savoring the sublime aftertaste of the wine and meat when taken at the same time. And why is this one any more important than the other rumors you heard circling about? I wonder how he wasn't fat with how he was competing with Volstig in the number of plates they've eaten, and chalked it up to God Jane. That, it's because it started circulating after the fight between the Mad Titans army and the Nova Corporation. Possibly the reason why they fought, at least according to the story out there, is for the possession of an Infinity Stone they found. I don't like where this is going, and I'm hoping it's probably just another rumor. But given what I know of Thanos and his multiverse-wide obsession with the stones to the point that he'd even risk a war against Xander foreshadows a bad foreboding. Which stone? I asked and saw a flash or worry pass through Thor's eyes for a split second, before he shrugged and took another swig from a new gourd he picked up. The Time Stone. The table we all sat around fell silent at Thor's words. I felt the urge to massage my head, while Wanda and Petro were visibly frowning. Times like these are when I really wish this universe was one I was knowledgeable about. I might have only the basic knowledge when it comes to the Infinity Stones, but even I can tell that someone having a relic of time itself is bad news for everyone. Petro said and the others beside him nodded. Can't the stones be destroyed? I think it's better if things like these didn't exist in the first place. Wanda asked. I sighed and replied. It's hard, very hard. I'd say it's rather impossible. It's an infinity stone after all. These things have been around since the very dawn of creation. Thor interjected, and though I knew otherwise, I didn't bother explaining how. Wanda being able to destroy the Mind Stone is because of their shared similarities in this universe. I doubt the current her could do the same to the other Infinity Stones, like her Infinity War counterpart did to the Mind Stone. Seeing the mood brought down with his words, Thor banged the table and said in a loud voice, Come on now, it's just a rumor. Even if there's truth to it, I doubt an ancient pebble can do anything to us. We are strong. We all nodded in agreement at his words, somehow falling into his pace without noticing. Arrogant as his words might feel to hear, I however think he is right. Well, hopefully it doesn't fall in the hands of Thanos. If it does, and the time stone at that, then I'd only agree with Thor, but with a 40% chance of winning. As stupid as the movies made it look, the time stone doesn't work like a spell with magic circles and whatnot. Not to mention that nobody here has a skill set that counters time manipulation. Petro maybe, but he isn't yet fast enough. I didn't ask anything else concerning the stones or Serta during the banquet and left it for when the festivities were over. No need to bring the mood further down. I looked at Wanda and Petro behind me, and I could tell that they were enjoying every moment here. Petro might just be enjoying the novelty of everything so far, and I could tell that Ms. Little Connoisseur of Magic would be visiting the Vanna Sorcerers after this. Me? Well there is no way I'm getting into Asgard's treasury. All will be granted entrance to study the Space Stone, so I might just relax. And maybe look into the rumor concerning the Time Stone while I'm at it. The banquet went on for a while, and I had to stop my high thought processes, just to enjoy a little bit of it. I was challenged to a few arm wrestling when everyone got heated up and won all my rounds, except the draw with Thor. Not that I was putting my all to it. And yes, I do know about giving face to the Prince of a Kingdom even if the latter might seem to care less of it. The banquet ended and were led to the guest quarters by the palace maids, who were laughing as Wanda gave Petro a stink eye after his endless flirting with them. Do try and keep it in your pants until we leave. I told him, but he only snorted at my words. As if you'd understand the thrill of getting with real non-human palace maids. He said, I didn't bother replying to that, chucking it up to some men's fetish with maids or Petro just being horny for sex with people he considers aliens. Do humans ever think that they also are aliens to other species outside of Earth? If they want to meet an alien so bad then why don't they just meet their neighbor? I don't bother telling Wanda when he sneakily sped off to catch up with the girls after we were shown to our rooms. A few minutes later, Thor came to our room in casual robes, changing out of the armor I've grown used to seeing him wear all the time. As for the robes, anyone with an eye for luxury could tell at first glance how expensive that thing would cost, and anyone with eyes like mine would see the faint strings of energy that flowed through every thread that stitched up the room. I see you aren't that surprised by my presence, he said after we sat down in the living room of the house they called a guest room. Even without trying to, 
I could feel your static from down the halls. I replied to which he just nodded as if it was normal. So what brings you here? As you very well know, my father has me cleaning up every sighting of Surtis spawns, and Dash. And it'll be hard to find time to help us verify the news concerning the time stone. Wanda completed and he nodded again. And both are of great concerns, not only to Asgard, but also to all the realms under its protection. He sounded tired as he said that. With the way he was slumped on the chair facing the ceiling, anyone would sympathize with him in his situation. I can tell it's being rough on you. I said. He laughed, looked at me, and thumped his chest. I am Thor. This is nothing to me. I've handled harder. Killed worst even. We can see that. But I don't think having to liberate planet after planet is a new ball game altogether. Way harder than waging wars and winning fights, I presume. He looked at the two of us in surprise before a grateful smile crept into his face. And you would be right, Wanda. You two really do make a nice pair. He then sat upright while looking at us and started. I also find it a bit too strange with Xander's direct confrontation with the Mad Titan's army. They usually never even cross paths. You think this rumor might really be true? Even with the sparse knowledge I had of those two galactic forces, I knew that Thanos clashing with Xander was over nothing minor. To my question he nodded. The reality stone is safely stored away from Asgard. The space stone lies dormant in my father's treasury, under his ever-watching eyes. You have the mind stone and my father also vouches for the safety of the soul which leaves us with only two unaccounted infinity stones. He said, holding up his fingers in show. The time and power stone. Correct. How four of the six appeared in such short time without anyone noticing is a little bit alarming. These things are just like trouble magnets. The moment one of them makes an appearance, the gears of the universe start spinning, making the other stones being attracted towards it and show their own appearance. It's only a matter of time before someone lands on Earth for the Mind Stone. With the number of alien spies on the planet, and the fact that any advanced race can sift through our satellites unnoticed, makes us start naked exposed. Can't Heimdall find the location of the stones? His sight can reach anywhere in the universe, right? I asked and was not surprised to see the slightly awkward look on Thor's face. It can, he said. But there are things in this universe that even his eyes can't see and places his sight cannot reach. And let me guess, Infinity Stones just happens to be one of them. Wanda stated plainly that it caused me and thought to chuckle. So, what do you want us to do? I asked, bringing us back to the reason why he came to meet us. He scratched his head causing his long hair to fall over one side of his face. Just out with it, Thor. He laughed a little awkwardly and spoke after a bit. I would have preferred it more to have the whole team. But I understand that you can't leave Midgard completely unguarded at any time. Regardless, with you guys here I was hoping to have you check it out instead. You guys are more technical than I am. I will provide a guide for you that knows their way across the nearby galaxies. And with Heimdall keeping an eye on you, I'll be able to plead my father to send his best Einajars as reinforcements if they are ever needed. At first glance, and even after running it through different thought processes, the pros far outweighs whatever cons it might have, but I had one question. Hopefully we won't need the reinforcement, but on the low probability that we do, won't it drag Asgard into whatever problem we might find ourselves in? Apart from the realms under it, I understand that Asgard doesn't involve itself with the wider universe and its problems. How I rule my subjects and the laws I impose on my realm are not matters you should concern yourself with, Stonekeeper. Odin Borson just entered the chat the doors to the room opened, and Odin strolled in with a soft stride. The guy was just a head shorter than Thor, but his physique that was full of bulging muscles were greater than Thor's, though it somehow created an illusion of him being shorter than he actually was. Wrinkled face that had half of it hidden under that thick beard of his, while the top held a golden crown that circled around his head, his gold mix obsidian eye patch, and a rather normal looking purple robe, a picture of a man that no one wanted to mess with. Was it also disturbing that I could only feel something from him because of the mind stone in my body? My computer senses were picking up nothing other than a healthy old man, while all I got from the passive function with the Mind Stone was just a feeling that there was something about him that was eluding me. Father. Thor stood up and bowed a little to Odin, an action me and Wanda copied before looking back up at the mythical Asgardian God King. At ease boy, I am here just to see the man who brought an Infinity Stone inside my palace, and the Chaos Touch companion he brought with him. He said with a stern gruff voice, that perfectly aligned with the picture of the strictly no-nonsense person I imagined he would be. Yes, these are Dash, 
I already know of them, boy. Vision and wonder of the Avengers, Earth's mightiest heroes. My friends and a group of the greatest warriors across the Nine Realms. Thor boasted while completely cutting off and ignoring his father. He then turned to us despite the straight eye from his father. Wonder and Vision, this is my father. I'm sure you have read numerous texts of him. But this is Odin, or father of Asgard, and its Nine Realms. Greetings, your highness. We bowed again and greeted him after Thor's introduction. It is not my misconception, but it felt like the place, the very atmosphere itself, became welcoming of our presence. The feeling of us being random strangers that wandered into a god's home left, and was replaced with the feeling of being invited guests. What was that? No query identified but something changed. No calculated evidence to your query but based on the feedback from the Mind Stone, it is presumed that the realm has acknowledged your presence mind your manners. 4. It will do you a lot of good to learn not to cut into my words when I am speaking. Odin said with a stern look on his face, but Thor only looked a little accepting of his father's reproach. And may I ask why you are here, father? He asked his father, while Wanda and I just traded eye contact, and watched the dialogue between the father and son. This is my castle, boy. I can go anywhere I want inside it. Completely unannounced into the quarters of guests and servants living on palace grounds. I doubt mother will take very kindly to hearing that. Thor's words were said in a way as if he was just stating them without any particular intentions behind them. And his father's reply was just as straight and casual. I'll beat out your teeth with that hammer of yours the day it reaches her ears. Thor smiled naturally, zero reaction to his father's words, and simply asked. Why are you here, father? We would have come to you had you called. Odin snorted, his stern facial expression never changing since the beginning, and turned back his focus on us. What is your purpose in coming here to Asgard while armed with an infinity stone? We have to reason for our presence here in Asgard. We only tried establishing communications with Thor, and the result of that was us landing on Gorag, where Thor had been. We helped him with dealing with the army of found demons before he invited us to his home. As for the Infinity Stone, it is an essential part of my existence, and I always have it on my person. I calmly explained to Odin what led us to Thor and the events that preluded it, and those that followed. He remained silent through the whole thing, both my recounting and Thor's interjections, calmly listening with an impassive face and the stern atmosphere around him. I have heard all that you've said till now, and I have all but one question to you and your companion beside you. He pointed at me and Wanda who stood slightly confused about what he wanted to ask us. You are looking for the Infinity Stones, and I want to hear your reason for seeking them out. And it will do you well not to lie to me in any way. Father. Silence. Thor. His voice was raised at Thor for the first time all the while his eyes never left us. I could feel the change in the air, but Wanda didn't. Odin was serious. I mean he always is, but this felt different. Lie. Completely impossible. I looked at Wanda, and she gave me a subtle nod, aware of some of the conjectures and plans I had for the Infinity Stones. Future plans. But I guess it now needs to be updated. I want to harness the power of the stones. I said. My reply left Thor looking shocked while Odin's expression remained the same. Despite his shock, Thor kept silent and just folded his hands. Why? One of the hardest questions to answer. My potential height as an enhanced by an extension body with an independent mind of my own isn't too high. And the only thing I know that can push far the limit of my existence are the Infinity Stones. I told him, took a deep breath and continued, I'd rather destroy the stones if not for that reason. If you want to ask what I want to achieve with the evolution I am aiming for, I can only say that it is to help me achieve my vision my purpose for existence. I don't plan to conquer, rule, or force my vision on anyone. I only aim to confirm my existence by achieving the purpose I set for it. My chest opened up, and the Mind Stone flew out of it and floated in the middle of the room, drawing everyone's eyes to it, until Odin reached out and grabbed it. I could feel Wanda's hands twitching to release a hex bolt at Odin for taking the Mind Stone, but she knew better than to do that, so she let me handle it in the way I could. Odin looked at the gem in his hands, staring intently at it for a bit, after which his brows went up in what I think might be surprise. He looked back at me with the gem held between two of his fingers. 
You have imprinted your mind on the stone, the result of which is now feeding the growing dormant ego of the stone. Thor looked confused at Odin's strange words, and questioned his father about what he exactly meant with his words. It means the mind stone will soon become alive in the truest sense of the word, and the sentient mind that will become the mind stone is him if he is successful. The clarification left Thor in a loop, while Wanda's eyes shot up as she understood the underlying implications of his words. You mean this will turn to the Mind Stone, some type of universal mind hub? She exclaimed in astonishment to which Odin let out a soft hum. The old god king then let the stone fall into his palms and held it out to me before speaking. You have shown me something new. And while your earlier words held no lies or jaded intentions, no one will allow you to possess the stones without doing anything about it, myself included. So tell me, what makes your intentions with the stones trustworthy? And what assurance can you give, that you won't stray off your noble path to protect your world with the power you aim to gain? I shook my head because I had no assurance to give, and I told him exactly that. You're right, my words alone are not enough. And I cannot promise you that I won't become extreme and unforgiving with my actions. For all I know and I'm sure of, the power will corrupt me, absolutely. This. I looked at Wanda who was currently distressed with her eyes, carrying an equal mix of concern and worry. So I took her hands in mine to reassure her, and kissed her on the cheek to placate her. My eyes were on her while my words were for Odin. I have no assurance of controlling the power of the Infinity Stones without becoming a tyrant. But what I can assure you is that I will never do it, if it risks her safety, or leads her to be hurt. You ask me for proof, and my proof is her as for whether my vision is truly noble and just. My proof is this. My left hand stretched out to Odin's that held the stone, but it didn't reach it. They looked at me, wondering what I was trying to tell with my action, but their wonderings didn't last for long as it was cut with the sound of thunder the air ripping apart, and a small boom as it broke through the walls, and laid itself tightly gripped in my hands. Jolna. Odin's eyes fully widened as he saw me lifting Jolna, after it responded to my call, before slowly looking at Thor, who shifted uncomfortably. So there were a few things I left out during the tales of my last journey to Earth, no biggies. Back on Earth immediately after Vision left, somebody triggered the alarm in the compound and the Overwatch in panic, as he saw a very familiar android walking through the halls of the compound. Before the android could understand why the alarms were triggered by its appearance, light flashed in front of it, and a group of people it recognized all too easily appeared from it. Yet again, before it could say anything the group broke into full combat mode with anger, worry and hate in most of their eyes. Ultron. How the hell are you still alive? Natasha asked as she studied the openings the robot exhibited, but that was the least of her worries. Where is he? Damn it, he's probably left his digital print on the internet before we got here. Hopefully he is as arrogant and chatty as he used to be. Seeing the look they were all giving him, Ultron sighed and raised his hand in a show of surrender, before speaking in a tired and familiar choice. Please don't destroy this body. It's still a prototype I'm working on. It was either this or taking one of Tony's. The AVENGERS Steve, Sam, Natasha and Davis who triggered the alarm, stood rooted to the ground fully stunned, as they heard Vision's voice from the robot. Poor approach, but nice plan. Where is Vision and what have you done with him, Ultron? Steve was very worried as he couldn't reach Vision, Wanda and Petro. Knowing Ultron, he could only assume the worst for Vision if he couldn't be reached. Okay. This is going to take a few minutes. Ultron sighed as the Avengers finally had enough and engaged. Seven minutes later they all sat down on the floor, looking awkwardly at the limbless form of Ultron, standing on his last literal leg, with every part of his armor busted. I can't believe this. Vision, or rather the backup copy of him that was piloting the Ultron lookalike bod, grumbled. Sam was the first to bite back at those words. What the fuck did you expect us to do? Talk it out. With you wearing an Ultron flashlight, it took a little bit of explaining amidst getting beat up at every corner, before they finally stopped attacking him, but the damage had already been done by then. So you guys are in Asgard? Steve asked, bringing them back to the reason why Vision was wearing Ultron's body. Vision's armless shoulders moved in a shrugging motion which looked hilarious to Sam, with the way he was struggling in holding back his laugh. I don't know where they are. Happened too fast for me to do anything about it or leave a notice. This body is programmed to automatically wake up when it loses signal with my main body, which is natural, 
since I definitely have no way of holding a connection that spans who knows how many galaxies. Natasha frowned, not finding the humor in this like Sam and Davis were doing. This has to be the most stupid thing you've ever done, Vision. For all we know you might be halfway across the universe, and we have no way of getting to you. And not to mention wherever you guys must have wound up since you seem sure that you guys definitely didn't go to Asgard. Vision wanted to say something, but held it back knowing that it wouldn't help at all. Instead, he tried placating their worries. Don't worry. The first thing I would do once I get the chance is trying to send back a message. And hopefully that doesn't take more than a week. But that also depends on if the civilization we find ourselves in is advanced enough. How would they know to send back a message? Sam asked, and he immediately got the feeling that had he been wearing an expressive face, Vision would have been staring at him like really. I'm Vision, Sam. Even if I have a thousand bodies at the same time, scattered all over the universe, our thought processes and protocols are still the same, unless something drastic happens to those bodies. Sam went oh hearing Vision's reply, while the others could only hope that the message came in earlier than Vision says. Vision POV after my little display to Odin. The man's surprise quickly faded, and after staring at me for a brief moment, he threw me the stone and turned around to leave, but not before leaving behind a few words. Tell the one with the quick feet to behave himself to his boundaries as a guest under my roof. Female Asgardians are fierce in their passion, and he wouldn't want one to bind him down in a ritual he will be oblivious to. Under our eyes, his form flickered and faded out like an illusion, and I guess I wasn't the only one caught off guard, because Wanda immediately turned to Thor. Was that an illusion all along? Thor nonchalantly shrugged and took his hammer off my hands. Probably. With him you can never know, trust me on that. Neither I nor Loki could figure out a single instance where he used an illusion without him telling us. Not even after a thousand years. The hell? Trust me Wanda. You can never tell unless he wants you to know. A bit dramatic I'd say. But Mother says that's where I get my flair for showing off. Thor said as he prepared to leave through the hole the hammer came in from. The maids are on their way to show you to a new room. I looked at Wanda after Thor flew off. And we both held the stare for five seconds before releasing a long breath. I thought you never get nervous. She stated as we both crashed into the bed. I chuckled and cracked my neck while answering her. I don't. There's just something about him that always keeps you on your toes when he speaks, right? She interjected to which I nodded in agreement. It's a subconscious reaction that you wouldn't even be able to tell until he leaves, and you find out that you are breathing a little easier after he leaves. I noticed the same reaction on Thor, but to a much subdued degree that I doubt he notices, probably because he's had a thousand years to get used to being in Odin's presence. Think you can fight him, or at least a chance of holding him off for some time. I looked at Wanda who had the gall to ask something so stupid, that I'd even go as far as to say blasphemous, if I were a worshipper of the Norse gods. Even if I use the stone to the limit, I can push it to and go 200% from the start. I'd still get destroyed by a word from him. That's strong. Huh? She mutters with a downcast expression. I think stories, movies and cartoons are giving you a flawed expression of what a god is, especially one like Odin who stands out even amongst the strongest gods of the universe. They might not be omnipotent, but to anyone not above their level they pretty much are. Because of a few cartoons and artworks that incorporate gods into their stories, most people have the misconception that gods aren't all that they are made to be in ancient stories and myths. These guys can paint on a canvas, and a new world will come into existence, just because they drew a picture of a planet. Yeah, I know, guess I'm getting a bit too conceited in my strength that I'm starting to doubt how wide the strength gap between me and those obviously stronger. I think I'll go get Petro before he sticks his dick in an overly passionate maid. That will use his essence as catalyst for a soul bond ritual. She pushed herself off the bed and went to look for our resident runaway. The maids came briefly after Wanda left to show me to another room, and I was thankful they weren't as free-spirited, forward and flirty as they were with Petro. Probably because I didn't show an interest or because of my relationship with Wanda. Whatever it is, it saved us from walking awkwardly and me trying to politely turn them down. Two days passed with me not doing much other than writing a letter along with a recording that I passed to Thor to help me deliver to Earth. I don't know how he was going to send it, as I doubt they used the Bifrost as an express mail delivery system, but I didn't bother asking about it, after he assured me that they will get it before the day ends. 
Wanda was ecstatic to exchange her knowledge of magic with a few of the Vanna sorcerers who remained behind after the banquet. As for Petro, he curbed his lust, at least to a degree, and focused more of his time fighting warriors in the training ground. I was the only one with nothing to do, especially after Thor's mother met us, and immediately took Wanda away for hours upon hours, probably magic-related and Wanda being a vessel of Chthon. While she noticed the moment Wanda used magic, I have a feeling she would have poached Wanda under her tutelage. Had it not been for Wanda's affiliation with Kamataj, my red head was shocked when Frigga called the Sorcerer Supreme that young old boy, only to fall speechless, when the Queen of Asgard mentioned that he was once her student in his younger days. That's a damn big flex if I've ever seen one. The next day, Thor came to notify us that our guide was ready for whenever we wanted to start investigating the rumors of the Time Stone. He and the others hurriedly left through the Bifrost after Heimdall informed them of another flame demon invasion. As Wanda was still in the middle of her magic practices, and Petro was gaining some training done without his speed, I had told him to tell the guide to meet us in the training grounds tomorrow, so the others could get a good night's sleep before playing Sherlock across the galaxy. Both of them were fast asleep as soon as they claimed their beds, while I busied myself inside my thoughts, while Wanda laid on top of my body, which quickly became her favorite way to sleep. I heard no other word from Odin after that day, and I wondered if he'd give me the space stone if I asked. But I refrained from doing that, at least maybe after this mission. Night passed in the blink of an eye, and we found ourselves in the training ground where we met our guide who surprisingly turned out to be Lady Sif. No offense, Lady Sif, but I thought you'd rather have fun fighting off the flame demons alongside your friends rather than playing guide for us. My curiosity peeked out as we made our way to the Bifrost at a leisurely walk along the Rainbow Bridge. Well, you're not exactly wrong and it wasn't just me. Thor and the others wanted to come along, but they couldn't because of the threat of flames demons across the realms. She said nonchalantly, and you became a guide because, because among all the people he knows and can reach out to, he trusts me more, and I know my way across all the quadrants and star sectors we will be visiting. And Thor seems to think this will be more fun than fighting flame demons, and so he managed to convince me to be your guide, denying a warrior a thrilling battle and instead making him a chaperone. I can't imagine how annoyed she must have felt. I can feel that she's not angry, a little off-put at not fighting along with her friends. But other than that she doesn't care much. Her mental defenses are quite high. So maybe it's because of the control she has over her emotions. Thank you. The least I could do is being sincere in my thanks which she good-heartedly accepted with a smile as we stepped into the dome. Good day Heimdall. We are leaving for Xander's outskirts. Sif said after greeting the gatekeeper with respect. Heimdall nodded and the mechanism of the Bifrost started spinning and the place started to brighten. Good luck was the last thing we heard before shooting off to the stars. Any particular reason why we are wherever the hell here is? Petro asked mild disgust as we weaved our way through a never-ending crowd of aliens. The natives of this planet were some type of octopus race, as they had tentacles for some parts of their bodies. Either their hair, fingers, arms or feet, a part of them, sometimes multiple parts, are made up of tentacles, hence Petro's disgust and aversion to bumping into any of them. I want to get the general state of affairs of the places we'll be going to from an information broker I know of, said Sif in a half mask disguise in a white wig. And would you mind telling us how you know a broker in whatever galaxy is this that is probably 100 light years away from Asgard? Wanda asked, having an easier time weaving through as she followed behind Petro and let him clear the way. Sif chuckled as she walked casually without having the slight difficulty in moving through the crowd's benefits of her training. Sometimes I feel a little adventurous and spend a decade or two traveling around, sometimes even longer until Fandral and the others come get me. I see. It's sometimes easy to forget that you guys live on for thousands of years. Believe it or not, Asgardians hardly ever live out their whole life and die naturally of old age. Even the old ones feel adventurous every now and then, seeking a spark of youthful thrill, and sometimes end up dying to it. Wow, that's a warrior race for you. They are all adrenaline junkies, and going decades to centuries without it might even drive some crazy that they'd go on a harebrained thrill chase without thinking calmly about it. At least that's my stereotype of them, and Sif's words does nothing to change it. You've been quiet for a while now, 
Simons, got something on your mind? Our warrior compass called out to me who stood at the end of a line. Nothing. Just picking up on what I can from this planet and reviewing it. I said and she didn't say anything again. We're here. The place she led us to looked like a fortune teller's rundown shop, with few people coming out of it at intervals. Ah, is that Xena I see? Finally visiting an old friend, a mole-like guy called out to her as soon as we entered the establishment that looked even worse on the inside. Fun fact, English is a universal language in the Marvel verse, and it was taught to the humans by the Eternals. By the gods no, strictly business, Sif coldly said and the mole laughed weirdly, and a scan of his outside thoughts showed his fanciful thoughts of longing for the cold baddest beauty, Xena, who only came around strictly for business. Of course, of course. It's you after all. How about trying to loosen up for once and have fun, eh? I know the best places. Hum, up for it. He said with open arms. But his only response was silence from Xena. Well, I tried. Seriously, try to please women these days. And they look at you like trash. Where did chivalry go? He whimpered with fake tears. State of affairs around Central Nova, Sector GN6308 and GN7015, Apollyon Quadrant. Sif said, and immediately the guy's demeanor changed. Don't tell me you're one of those idiots pursuing a stupid rumor. I can see now why Sif would come to this guy despite his blatant efforts in trying to get into her pants. Just like Sif's Xena persona. This guy was strict with his business, and didn't let any of his tomfoolery get into it. Bounty and rescue, Sif said and he believed her and then looked at the three of us standing behind her. Gotta be a big bounty or a high profile rescue target for you to bring extra workforce, instead of going solo like you mostly do. How about giving me some crumbs about what game you're hunting? Good enough, and I'll give you an extra discount for your information. Another bout of silence and he finally gave up and went into the back room and came out soon after with a drive which he inserted into a monitor, and copied a few things into it, before handing it to Sif, who then threw it at me, while she transferred him a few points, the predominant currency of this part of the universe, after I went through it. Last updated two days ago as nothing major or minor of any kind or scale has happened. Always a pleasure doing business with you, Xena. How about a rain neck for that relaxation trip we were talking about? Sif said nothing else and walked out of the establishment still in her cold persona, only dropping it after we got to the outskirts of town. Got anything? I shook my head and she nodded as if she already expected an answer like that. Thought so. Those encryptions were so scarily advanced that even Friday's security protocols don't even compare. If I had tried forcing my way into it, then it would have sent a ping across the next 10 star sector that carried my digital stamp. I guess technopaths are a thing around these parts. She nodded. And an annoying bunch too. Even his mind was highly protected that I could only get a red on things he didn't bother keeping behind mental blocks. I doubt it's magic or skill, tech probably. Wanda's complaint came, facing the same issues I did. Makes sense that an information broker's top enemies would be technopaths slash hackers and telepaths. Wouldn't want them running away with their whole business, now would they? Petro said and then raised up an observation he noted during our time with the broker. You never mentioned his name, not even once. That's because no one knows his name. Some brokers are like that overly paranoid for the right reasons. Some even take it even farther by never setting shop down, as they move from star to star, and have their clients find them. Sif said and led us towards an interstellar airport where we boarded a plane to our next destination. It hasn't even been a day yet and I've seen things, technology that will make Earths look like it was made in the Stone Age. Even on planets that look way worse than ours. They had technology that eclipsed ours. So much so that it made Fury's prize phase 2 look basic. We were dropped off in a place between Sector G and 6308. And a Nova military outpost. Which was a den of criminals and a budding underworld. Despite its proximity with Nova's military outpost. From a backwater planet to the underworld. At least we're moving higher. Petro said as we rode in a subway to the city below the one above. Why are we here? Sith. I asked. She replied, to lease out a ship and see if we can get another story of what happened that caused the fight that has half the universe scared of a universal wide war. And you guys might want to change your appearance because races like yours are quite rare after all. We don't want the focus now when we haven't even started our mission. Sif gave us one last piece of advice, and with a few taps and configurations, Wando and Petro changed their look while I just went back to default and switched the color to a dark blue. To us we remained unchanged, 
But the others will see a group of a normal bounty hunting group, nothing standing out. Both of you stay here and see if you can pick up anything. Simons will come with me as I need his help. Sif said and led us into what looked like an art museum, mixed with a stripper's club and a casino. We went through a few back doors and met up with the guy Sif wanted to lease a ship from. Xena, now that's a rare face to see. Is this a good or bad omen? The owner of whatever this place is was a buff man with protruding exoskeletons in dirty overalls, fixing a small pod. I want a ship. Of course you do. That's the only reason anyone would be on this floor in the first place. He said plainly and signaled one of his workers to take over the repairs, and started inquiring Sif of the specs of the ship she needed. Switching up from your usual fit, that dingy thing. Or are you trying to impress a guy? He looked over at me and whistled. Zathorians. That's an acquired taste. An excellent one too. Do you mind hurrying up? I asked him and he smirked at me. Hold on for a bit, man. Patience means how long you last. That's why they say patience is important. He said, adding his own version of a patience quote. He brought up a holographic contract that Sif signed without thinking too much. Here's the key. It'll be rolled up by the time you get to the surface. Now, I have a beauty to attend to if you mind. We left his repair shop and went up a couple floors, only to arrive in a room of Chaos's blasters. Bullets and magic flew around haphazardly. What the hell happened here? Seth asked in a measured voice. Let's go. I call Petro and Wanda over and listen to them narrating how the fight started with a guy of the same race as Wanda and Petro's disguise walking up to them and trying to have Wanda join him. And when she refused coldly, his first reactions was to punch Petro, which resulted in him losing both his legs, and then chaos followed. Not like I can expect anything else from lowlifes like them. Sif said as left for the exit only for someone to call us from behind. I tilted my head to the side to get a look of who made us stop without turning back, and guessing from the way people were scurrying away and quieting down, as he took composed strides towards us. This guy was strong, no doubt. That was my honest thought about the guy, and the way Sif's hand stealthily edged towards her sword as we got surrounded was proof. I've never seen one of their kind being a speedster, so my bet is experiments of bio-upgrade. But that aside, your friend there called us lowlifes, and all I see are gentlemen in this fine establishment. Am I right? Yeah, tell them Gork. The audience were hyped up, and his crew had their eyes trained on us, mostly on Petro and Sif, hands already on their weapons currently being pointed at us. Seeing the crowd's reaction, the guy, Gork, spread his arm out wide. You see, we are all fine gentlemen here. I don't want trouble. No, no. We talk this out like men, yes. The situation was already as annoying as it could get, and I was heeding Sif's words of not starting trouble, just to not complicate our journey going forward, or else I would have reduced them all to dust. The point, I asked with a voice that showed just how fed up with this farce I was. Quite an attitude, man, but I understand. Just have your friend point out who she was calling a low life, so we can identify that person and kick him out. We will be square that way, he said. I turned back to Sif and asked as we were running out of time. Any problems if I kill them all? Better to avoid that, or we'd be hard pressed to get a ship as easy as this. She said. Our voices weren't low so everyone around us heard what we said, including Gork too. Hey, are you looking down on me? He stopped forward with a frown on his face, almost a head taller than me. Kindly fuck off, will ya? I said and the moment he tried grabbing my neck. I grabbed him while his hands passed through me. His eyes turned white and rolled up as he died after I severed everything in his neck, veins, muscle, spine, windpipe and all. Let's go. I said led my group out of the place, while everyone else looked on dumbly at the dead gawk. The ship was in a hangar on the surface, and with how hasty Sif felt as we went back to the subway, I made an educated guess of possible scenarios that caused her current state. They are coming for us, aren't they? She nodded. I gave Petro a look which he understood and his body flickered for an imperceptible instance. Small number. 42. I then asked Sif the same question I asked her before killing Gork, and her answer this time was different. This isn't on anyone's business or private property so apart from the authorities, no one will care about it. Do you want to kill them all? She asked after we got inside the train taking us back to the surface along with our attackers. Yes. She cracked a grin at me and unsheathed two short blades. I was apprehensive about fighting inside the building because we'll be instantly surrounded by all the forces in the underworld. 
But that's not a concern now. Of course the warrior from the Battle Maniac race will find this exciting, but at least she knows when she's over her head or in an unfavorable situation. The doors to the compartment we were in were opened from both sides by an angry mob, which scared the other passengers who had been sitting to the other compartments. I took a seat which earned me a confused look from Sif, but I just waved her off. You guys are enough. I am overkill. We exited the subway as spotless as we went in, as long as one ignored the three pairs of bloody footprints trail that Sif, Wanda and Petro left on the ground, with every step they took to the hangar. Someone's bound to put up a bounty on our head for that squabble, Sif said, but the rest of us just shrugged. The hangar only had one craft in it, the one Sif booked. This thing got to cost more than a few zeros, right? It normally costs around the same price as a large solar system. That's approximately five times the system Midgard is in comma. Just so you know, by the gods. How rich does one need to be to buy a solar system? Maybe I should take up bounty hunting as a side job after this. Leaving Petro to himself to marvel at the ridiculous extent that money has gotten in this part of the universe. I took control of the ship and completely downloaded its schematic before adding it to the other blueprints I've acquired since leaving Asgard. Building this thing ain't cheap. Maybe it is for Chala, but definitely not for Tony if they are buying the materials. I kicked the ship into motion and took a few minutes to get a real feel of it, before kicking it into hyperspeed and tearing through the planet's atmosphere with little to no resistance. Hey Simons, I've been meaning to ask. But are you a machine or a mix of both? Sif asked as she took the secondary pilot seat next to mine, since we were alone as Wanda and Petro were busy checking out the ship. I can be either, both and none. I answered. Huh. I then gave the simplified version which also is the longer one. I mean I can switch between being a machine if I want, a human like I mostly do comma, or a mix of technology and living flesh. Just see me as a normal human with the power to become a super durable robot if I want to be. Oh, now I see. That makes a lot more sense if you put it that way. Her ridiculous reply made me shoot her a deadpan. You have a sword that can cut through virtually anything if you're strong enough. Friends with a demigod. A real life mythical warrior. And you guys have a magic Uber Express. That shoots you to any way you want to go in the universe. And there's something about me that doesn't make sense. I don't know why she found it funny. But she did. Okay, truce. Let's just say that there are some parts of us that don't really make sense. Ham. I rolled my eyes but agreed nonetheless. Not a fair truce. But I guess we can call it a tie. Initiating spatial tunneling in 3, 2, 1 sequence. Initiated spatial tunneling successful Sif POV Thor's friends are weird. But then again, I think that says a lot about me and others, as we are also his friends, oldest friends might I add. Wait, doesn't that mean we are the weirder ones since we've been with him for so long? So where are we headed to? The one blessed with godly speed Petro asked as he perused the different spatial points we've made jumps at. If we want to know what happened, it's best if we go where it happened. The red-haired sister of his, a distinguished sorceress, asked. And that is, a few system clusters away from Nova Central. It's a more neutral place, but it's still in Nova territory. I picked up a few bounty to sell our disguise better. But we should expect a squabble if whatever happened back there pissed someone a little bit influential. They both nodded in understanding, and for once I was glad of this change of pace. Not that I hate them or anything, but hanging out with Thor, Thandral, Hogan and Volstig takes a lot of mental fortitude in order to keep up with half the things they get on with every twice in a while. Thor and Volstig are simple-minded brutes whose answer to everything revolves around smashing it to pieces until it disappears. If it doesn't disappear, then that just means you're not smashing it hard enough ergo you're not strong enough. Though Thor had calmed a lot down after his return from his short banishment, a change I'm mostly proud of, just not the cause. Which ultimately leaves Volstig as the sole unthinking brute of my closest comrades. Hogan and Fandral are intellectuals, both in politics and common knowledge. But the former is a very passive warrior, and is mostly alright with just going along with the majorities, meaning Thor's vote. Fandral, on the other hand, besides his horrendous acts of philandry and unending flirting, is too laid back and slothful despite being an elite warrior of the realm. Normally you'd think that would be Volstig based on stereotypical conjectures, but then you'd be normally wrong. I'm really digging this Omnitranslator Thingy's vision whipped up. Takes care of the awkward language barrier we would be facing otherwise. Petro remarked, we could have bought those when we land, 
but it seems Vision copied the data print from one of the people we fought back there. The three of them, even Petro who seems a bit carefree and with a penchant for mischief, were about the average man in terms of intellect and prowess. Truly a marvelous group. And Thor said there were a whole group of them. If the rest of their group are as strong as they are, then they are truly fearsome and mighty, as Thor made them to be. It would truly be a pleasure to meet and cross blades with warriors of such pedigree. The doors to the ship's hub slid open as Simons came in, blinking as he looked out the windows before turning to me. Why aren't we just jumping through spatial points? He asked. With how they carry themselves most of the time, sometimes I forget this is their first time traveling the stars. This sector is privately owned and has a spatial lock around it, and forcefully initiating a spatial jump outside designated areas is tantamount to breaking the law and will be branded as criminals. Which means we'll have the Nova Corporation after us at every turn. I diligently explained to him which he nodded in understanding. Which will make it even harder to walk in Nova territory, for the specific reasons we are going there. See what I mean? You don't have to even finish a sentence before they get it. Simon's hands turned robotic, and he fiddled with it for a bit before they turned back normal. I've been downloading all the spatial coordinates I've come across along with the ones I copied from a few bounty hunters to make a universal map, or the start of one. You can get something like that when we land. It's not cheap, but I think with your expertise it'll come along easily. I informed him. It would be bad if he tried hacking someone's network and got found out, especially in the near the heart of Nova Central. I see. That's a lot better. I'm guessing it'll also contain data on the soul system. He asked easily. I replied, buckle down, we'll soon be arriving at the nearest jump point. I kicked the ship into full drive and enjoyed the ride from there. I wonder how Thor and the others are doing. Vision POV definitely the most advanced planet I've seen so far. I idly noted as we went through security at the dock and stepped inside the city. Task generated running passive probe on citywide network hub status. Ongoing grading system security level in comparison with highest secured system identified cataloging incoming data streams Joltron Pro Calls. Currently updating this planet's security is outrageously tight. Drones, street cams, some even microscopic dash echo radars, motion mapping and a few more. All public areas are simply red zones for criminals and crimes, unless they create their own blind spot. My expectations for Xander's just got higher. Finally understand, huh? This is why I wanted to avoid confrontations until we get started on our mission. Said Sif after she noted how we were reacting to the security, in Wanda and Petro's case. With this place's security, every local force, bounty hunter and bandit, would have identified us as soon as we stepped into the city, and tracking our movements from this point onwards would have been easier. I expected it, but finally understanding the scale of it paints it a lot clearer. If I were truly human, I'd probably be feeling a lot excited at the prospect of increasing my processing capacity to the higher levels of this universe. Like this city which clearly has a full-spec artificial intelligence, that processes the never-ending trillions of bytes of data streams coming in every microsecond from the city's network, and the satellites that monitor all spatial movements spanning solar systems, a dozen times the size of ours without an infinity stone aiding it. Seeing and experiencing it in person really undersells the crazy advancements of the wider universe, with how the comics focus much on Earth and its heroes. Even if Earth is given a thousand years to progress without any outside help, while the rest of the universe remains stagnant, they won't still be anything in front of civilizations like this. Truly an eye-opener, and coming from me, that's saying something. So, what now? Bounty hunting, information gathering, or efficiently both? I turned to Sif and inquired after taking in everything and getting over it in a split second. Both. Smart choice in picking the best option. I'll admit I'm not too experienced in covert missions like these, so I'd be relying on you for that. Also, I'm not too knowledgeable about this city, being the second or third time I've been here. She truthfully admitted, don't worry. This after all is our mission and you've done a lot for us despite us only needing a guide. I'm sure we would have been in worse states if we had followed another guide. Wanda threw an arm over the taller woman and reassured her for her great efforts. Sif smiled and nodded. Thor did say I can return after making sure you guys are sufficiently knowledgeable about what you want to do and where you guys are going. But if it's all right with you, Please allow me to continue lending my strength. I assure you with my honor as a proud warrior of Asgard, I will keep on giving my best. Whoa, whoa, no need to go so far. Sister. Wanda quickly stopped her from giving probably a warrior's promise slash oath and drawing attention to us. Trust me, 
We'd love to have you with us all the way. She brought her head closer to Sif's ears and whispered, And between us girls, I'd appreciate the company more than having to deal with my annoying brother and keeping him in line since Vision tends to ignore him a lot these days. Hey, I heard that. Petro exclaimed, not amused by being indirectly called mischievous. I see. Then as you so graciously called me a sister, my help to you is given any time you require it. Sif solemnly nodded before continuing to lead us deeper into the city. It's rare to see given how smart she is most of the time that I somehow forget how blunt and straightforward Asgardians are. So, about the bounty. Which one are we going for? Rescue or killing? I asked to get us back on topic after we boarded one of the flying local transports. Killing first. The client for that one is in this city, and we can ask him for the information we need without appearing too interested in it other than surface curiosity. She said, she's working a web trail that won't draw attention to us, while we also clarify the information they have. Given how the city's security seems a bit tense, it seems that the fight against Thanos and the Nova Corps is still fresh, and they might possibly be expecting another one. I'm almost sure of the veracity of the rumor, given how frequent the topic is being brought up by civilians all over the city. Wanda and Sif frowned, with Petro looking mostly concerned. That makes it more pressing that we confirm and find out what happened to the Time Stone, if it turns out the rumor's been right all along. That's the best case scenario, even if we end up crossing paths with Thanos. However, it's a lot different if it's in the hands of Nova Empire. I said and looked at Sif which prompted the others to look at her. She nodded and clarified. The forces of the Nova Empire are not a strong power in the universe, and the reason Allfather forbids us from starting a war with them unless they attack first is the outcome. Why? Petro pressed further, but it was Wanda who answered instead of Sif. Probably because of the aftermath a war with them will result in. They are obviously a much needed force of balance in these parts of the universe, and if people see them in a weakened state, They'll jump at them like sharks to blood, and from there it's a stew of cooking chaos, open for anyone with power, schemes and influence to stir however they want. It's a whole lot worse than the vague picture she painted, but that's the general idea. Xander's forces are nothing to Asgard, but the reason I think everyone is on tenterhooks when it comes to the stone is because of the Kree. Thanos and Xander in a weakened state at the same time will allow a whole lot of uglies to tar their heads. Please, spare me. I have three wives and eight children. Have pity for them if not for me, please. They can't survive if I die. The Xeraxian with cybernetic implants begged the looming executor in front of his kneeling self. However, unlike the grace he fervently hoped for, his executor's cold apathetic voice sounded with the crushing decree of the end of his living journey. Don't worry, they will be joining you soon. The red eyes that stared at him killed his hopeful prayers and hollowing despair, leaving him with only the calm of acceptance. The last thing he saw was a red light that blocked his view of his loyal and hardworking subordinates, who all laid unmoving, dead, and then he knew nothing no more. Not the concerns of his loving family, the worrying dangers his subordinates' families would be thrust into, or how his subordinates were heinously murdered. They all led true and honest lives, never making enemies of others, or quickly resolving any instance of one. But then, life was always cruel. Not unfair, cruel. Always favoring the strong and mighty. The top of the food chain. Also where 99% of living beings could never reach in their lives. Oh life, how cruel thou truly art. I think we are about done with them. Only his family remains. The executor, a red-haired woman with glowing red eyes, spat out with disgust as she turned away from the dust remains of the disintegrated leader. The burning ship rumbled with sparks running through it, but the woman, looking unconcerned, walked out of the cockpit, taking careful steps not to step on the sea of dead bodies. That littered every part of the ship. Done. She asked as she came across a woman wielding jewel daggers, who succinctly replied, thoroughly, then let's go. This place makes me sick. She said and walked past her companion towards the portal that opened just spawned. The portal closed as soon as both women stepped through it, just three seconds before the ship broke down to space dust with the explosion that followed. In another cloaked ship hundreds of kilometers away, the two women stepped out of the portal's end point and turned to the sole person who welcomed their arrival. Was Petro, the red-haired Wanda, asked upon noticing her speeds to sibling's absence. Vision's absent-minded reply informed her inquiry, while his hands tap danced on floating keyboards. He's taking care of the loose ends. Reckon he'll be back any moment now. Wanda nodded and proceeded to walk out of the cockpit. I'm going to take a bath. 
Maybe do a mind cleanse while I'm at it as I feel that my body is not the only thing that is feeling dirty. That bad, huh? Vision asks if the sole audience in the room which brought out a wry smile in her previously cold face as she looked at the door Wanda walked through. It's a normal reaction that can even affect a cold-hearted vermin, talk less of a noble spirit. She said and started walking towards the door, also feeling the need to have a bath and washed her bloodied body. Even you. Vision questioned curiously. Even me. I'm just used to it, and don't let it affect my mind all that much. Not that the grim reminders are ever a past thought. With that she left to her quarters, leaving Vision to whatever had his attention, or at least his visual focus. Wanda came back a few minutes later, looking a lot calmer than how distraught she looked before her bath. She peeked a look at what Vision was doing over his shoulders, and left him to himself, after receiving long hot kisses from him, before Sif's arrival put a stop to it. She sat with Sif, studying a magic codex on her lap, and chatting with the femaleus guardian, who was cleaning and sharpening her swords and weapons. Petro arrived later as if he had forcefully been chugged out of existence which he had panting. Vision glanced at him and opened his palms, and something from Petro's belt flew into his palms, which drew his focus from the panting silver head speedster. But not his remark. That's over 10 minutes late from my highest estimate. What happened? The disc in his hands broke down into smaller parts, except a tiny piece of it, which enlarged to a bigger size as Vision took hold of it. Finally getting his breath in order, Petro stood up after the dizzy spell faded away and complained. Well, those guys were the worst. So much so that I decided to go extra slow just so they knew they were going to die. Didn't want them to die peacefully or without them knowing when or how they died. Petro looked at Wanda and Sif chatting together after they acknowledged his presence and made the popular decision of taking a bath. That thing felt too trippy to use. Regular people will definitely have some form of deformities if they go through that. Might even become vegetables from the damn woozy you get with every jump. Vision silently noted the user review and stored it aside. Giving the mental commands, the ship started moving for the return journey, as Petro joined them again after being gone for seconds, drawing a frustrated slight complaint from his younger twin. Why do you speedrun bathing of all things? How do you even enjoy it? I bet it's a spin for a wash and one for a rinse. Petro snorted and stole the bowl of snacks Wanda had at her side. I'm not discussing my bathing decisions with you Wanda. Never wanted to hear it. Just asked because of an off-putting curiosity. She said a side glare at him, while her partner just ignored them altogether, getting used to their sibling banter. One she is familiar with in the case of Thor and Loki, which was not a good comparison, after she gave it another thought. So, anyone wants to fill me in? Or is it bad that you don't want to talk about it? Vision waved the projection in front of him and turned to his group. Where do I even begin with this shit? Petro started with a tired drawl. Imagine the Varnus of the ancient barbarians from Earth, every single evil thing you can think of, big and small, from the sacrifices to cannibalism, and everything around and in between. Can you paint that mental picture? Quite literally if you want. Vision said dryly. Ha ha. Nice one. Petro gave him a thumbs up with a facial expression that didn't match his chirpy tone or his gestures. Nevertheless, he continued. So yeah, take that and then imagine the kindest and most peaceful people you can think of the type that'll sit with a beggar and converse with him for hours on hours, even helping him beg the passing crowd, just to make him feel loved and important. Got it. Good. Now he sat, chuckling as he saw Wanda's twitching face, popped a few candies and nuts into his mouth the alien variety dash, and brought his two hands out, and slowly inched them to each other until they touched and intertwined fingers together all the while narrating his tale with crisp visual, as if wanting Vision to see exactly what he saw and experience, down to the last pebble. Now take those two and bond them together, down to their tiniest cells. An interesting combination, right? But it's not the end as we can't forget the little condiments that spice everything up to a wholesome package. Gone was the chirp in his voice and the gestures, leaving only a deep and apparent disgust and hatred as every syllable left his mouth. Add in a little Newton, Alexander the Great, Einstein, Plato, Confucius, Sun Tzu and Da Vinci. Hell, throw in Martin Luther King and Michael Jackson into the mix as well. Cause why not? With the suaveness and eloquence of a high-class prostitute, pure heart of a Samaritan and the actions of any evil you can think of, I give you one of the wonders of the known universe the Xeraxians. Petro finished his rant with cold fury stoked eyes that were reflected in those of Wanda and Sif, and slowly laid his back to rest on his chair with a closing remark. And all those worst things you thought of, even the smallest one like badmoothing a person, 
They never do it to one of their own. Fucking creeps. I wish someone blows up their planet. Sigh. Looks like you guys went through a lot, mostly mental I'd say. Was all Vision could say after all that, which caused Petro to chuckle sarcastically, Wanda snorting, and Sif giving a raised eye as if that was all he could say, all to which he could only shrug. Hopefully, you guys can get refreshed, clear your heads, and possibly expunge the murderous forethought you are all leaking out when we port. Sif and I will claim a reward and ring out some info from our client, maybe use a little bit of coercion to make it smoother. He said as their ship shook a bit as it landed on the docks of Kanda, their temporary base until they got some new info. I thought the place was too secure to be causing problems. Wanda asked as they all walked out of the ship, past security, and re-entered the beautiful city. Vision patted her on her shoulders with a patronizing look on his face, and infuriating words that complimented his face. Oh Wanda, don't you know that there's no such thing as a perfect defense? Doubly so when it comes to technology. She glared at him and slapped off his hands. But Vision only smiled in amusement. Creating blind spots in its surveillance is easy. And besides, they don't invade private residences with their surveillance system. Sif patted Wanda and Petro on their shoulders with sympathetic comfort. Simons is right. A warrior's mind is his greatest weapon, more so than his weapon. A strong mind yields an unbreakable resolve. And an unbreakable resolve leads to greater strength. And trust me when I say this, the universe has much worse to show. They nodded and trudged their way along. Petro leading Wanda along for a quick exploration, while the other two, Seth and Vision, went ahead with their mission. I see someone finally got rid of those bastards. Even going as far as to clean out one of their breeding cesspools. Glad you did, but I'm afraid there is no extra tip for the effort. An orange-skinned man with same-colored hair said as he reviewed the authenticity of Vision and Sif's report, one confirmed by nearby authorities they reported it to. Sif, still in her Xena disguise, waved off the man's words in disinterest. Not needed. They are common enemies in hundreds of galaxies. So it's nothing more than taking care of trash at its roots. The man nodded in understanding as he easily read Sif's words. Personal history, I see. Not that I'm surprised as it's the same with a lot of people. That aside, since it's a joint request, your bounty will automatically be deposited in a few minutes by the bank. Anything else I can help you with? Sif looked at Vision, and the latter took the reins and inquired about the Time Stone, and the information regarding Thanos' armies and the Nova Corporation. He wasn't at all subtle or secretive with his words which were spoken casually, painting a picture of simple curiosity to be generally knowledgeable about what had happened. Like expected, the man didn't suspect anything since he gets asked this question a lot, and from the information on Xena's public portfolio. She appears to be one of the few morally upright bounty hunters. As for Vision asking, the man just took it as simple curiosity from a newbie bounty hunter as his portfolio was as new as it could get. An eager and curious fish let out into the vast sea of space a general conclusion, given how Vision portrayed himself. Nothing everybody doesn't already know. Got no idea why that madman's people were in Nova territory in the first place. But they insisted they were pursuing one of their own turned traitor. Given how close it was to Xander, they were quickly notified, and when those on site pressured the alien vessel to come aboard and investigate their traitor, and why they were in Nova territory in the first place, with such a warcraft no less, those bastards attacked. Hum, Vision appeared visibly confused and scratched his head. Surely that isn't such a smart thing to do, right? Wouldn't it have been better to wait for the nearby reinforcements, than trying to provoke a clearly hostile vessel? By now, a few people were listening, and instead of it being a conversation between Vision and the guy, those around started throwing their own thoughts and what they heard. True, but given the way Xander mobilized a huge force and got there in time before they could escape, I think they were already aware of their movements, or at least had a lookout for it. A guy with fangs that extended out of his mouth said, and a few others nodded with his words, while another added in the same vein. Yeah. I think so too. And don't forget that security in some quadrants and sectors in Nova's empire went up a few months prior to the fight. The military guys were moving on and off planets, even dead ones, as if looking for something. What, really? You think they already had info on the appearance of the Time Stone inside their territory prior to the arrival of Thanos' battleship? Vision asked while looking as if he was very interested in the conversation. Stop asking stupid questions, Da Vinci. We still have a few targets to hit before heading back to GN6308. His boss, Xena, chided coldly and started wrapping things up to leave. Come on, 
Don't tell me you're not at least curious. He noticed a few people who were discreetly paying rapt attention to the conversation around him, more than likely in the market for information. Sif might not have known why he suddenly decided to not be discreet as they fished for information, but she didn't doubt or question him, and expertly played along. Such a blessing that being cold and no-nonsense came natural to her, as that was what she usually came off as when she spoke fewer words, preventing the Asgardian bluntness that borderline ignorance and airheadedness from coming out when she speaks. No, I don't. The less I know about it the better, same should go for you. Who knows whether another fight will spill out in the coming days or months, better we are nowhere near here if it does. She said and walked out, leaving Vision who looked as if he was torn between choosing obedience or curiosity. The orange-skinned man who settled their rewards, nudged him a little, and tilted his chin in the direction Sif left in. She's not all that wrong, you know. Everyone is a bit too excited about the rumor being that they were fighting over an infinity stone. Something no one has seen in thousands of years. Even if it was true, it'll probably end up falling in Xander's hands. Which I think is safer for everyone. Some agreed and some did not. Most remained silent as the talks went on. But Vision had already left and tracked Sif on her way to Wanda and Petro's location, a fancy high-class confectionery. He easily caught up to her with the expressive face he showed the entire time back there long gone from his face. That was a bit different than I expected. But did you get anything from it? Sif asked after they reached the twins and sat with them. I hoped it would have been a more private checkout with how large the target mission was, but it obviously wasn't so I had to improvise. Vision smoothly replied. He then went on further. We didn't expect the mission to go through a legal system, which is probably why most people didn't do it. Also the fact that it's close to Xander and news of their altercation with Thanos. Most people won't pick it based on that fact alone, talk less of tracing who and where the bounty came from. Wanda pointed out, exactly. And it was a lot easier to make people talk when everyone is talking, especially about common things, as no one will feel left out or ignorant that way. Even those fishing for info lowered their guards a bit to act natural and blend in when we started talking. Little mental nudges from the end the fact that everybody wants to appear more knowledgeable than the other person, even subconsciously, makes it easier for them to spill what they know and I managed to read a few thoughts and gain some new info. They talked freely as if chatting about casual things as none of their words sounded out, literally so that if someone sat shoulder to shoulder with them, they still won't hear a word or hear something else completely. All Wanda's handiwork. So what's our next step? Sif asks being the most ignorant when it came to spy work or anything similar to it, unless when it involved cutting someone down. Vision tapped a rhythm on the table, and laid out their next best course of action. Either try and approach the system where they fought, but the entire system around it, and neighboring ones are all under heavy surveillance, with strict clearance passes. An obvious reaction. There are a few people in the city that claim they were around the place where the fight started and when it did. A bit risky as some of them are rather high profile, already left the city, or are simply lying, and or know nothing new or important. Obviously a bit time consuming too. Easiest way would be to buy new info from a broker, but it's the easiest to get tracked or taken note of even when disguised. The brokers work for the main city, so they report anything suspicious to it, either for the continued security or pass to continue their business. There's no way the city won't make use of its underground information hub, and with that we can be easily traced back to the docks. But you can easily take care of the public security, right? Petro asked, not seeing what the problem was which Sif actually did. That'll only draw more attention from the city and its security, if Simons continually deflects or disarms their pre-programmed surveillance systems. She then looked at Vision. Which one should we do? Buying the information is the easiest. But it doesn't necessarily mean that even if we do get noticed, they'll ardently track our movements. We won't be the only ones fishing for that information, right? The others nodded at her words, even Vision did. But Vision still didn't agree with it. Time efficient, easiest and arguably also the safest, also marginally the most accurate all reasons to go with it. But I'd rather we go with the second. Besides, nothing is stopping us from choosing both options. And I also mentioned picking up some good info from some of the informants and bounty hunters. Who were there keeping a group here in case anything new pops up. Wanda immediately caught his line of reason. You want to target them first the informants in the buyer's dash? Possibly hitting both options at the same time with more diminished risks. She theorized and got a fist bump from Vision. Petro only let himself focus on the good part. So we are staying here a day longer or two. Cool. 
might hit up a few stores and try their services. Maybe even enjoy the break like a tourist. What do you say, Sif? Up for showing me the local sites. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, I'm not a local, nor am I familiar with the city. You can get the information from those robots stationed everywhere in the city though. She genuinely replied and gave a sincere suggestion which just stomped Petro harder, earning him a gloating giggle from Wanda, while Vision focused on other things. More serious things. Thor Odinson POV Thor along with his friends, the fabled Warrior Three and a fewer squadron of Asgard and Vanaheim's finest, were put through a test of both mental and physical endurance, as they faced enemies after enemies not only limited to Surda's flame demons. Hayes, all this fighting and blood is making me itchy, and for once not the type I enjoy scratching. Fandral halved as he supported his tired self with Volstig, by resting their backs against each other. And why don't you scratch it the way you know how? Volstig teasingly mocked, fully aware of just how important the suave man valued his looks and comfort and his public image. While smelling and tired as a bull snipe. No, thank you. I rather not have my hygiene and virility wrongly accused and put into question in such a way. Fandral gritted out. Clearly tempted but not foolish enough to risk further fatigue in hostile lands, and put not only himself, but his friends and fellow warriors in danger. Not to mention the shame that will come on him, and the mockery of his mighty valor, even if he survived. He'd rather be cast and bound to Niflheim by the Allfather himself to eternally suffer its deathly cold and freezing tundra, than suffer the likely resulting public shame he'd face. That will no doubt make his ancestors cut their beard in shame, when he crosses the glorious gates of Valhalla if he is even worthy to grace his sights upon them, by the time he crosses over the great river. Ah, he is lost in his thoughts again. It really spins a baffling tale how someone with such misconstrued priorities, climbed the ranks of Asgard's elite warriors, even having the ballads sing his tales. Volstig pondered out loud, and yet still, Fandral showed no reaction. Are you under your god's influence right now? Or do you speak such scholarly words when you are sober? Volstig tilted his head and halved as saw a silently smirking Hogan leaning against a tree. The sky rumbled darkly, and with it came the white cracks of lightning, which was followed by the natural booming of thunder. It went after its spontaneous, albeit, natural order, and brought back the clear sky as well as Thor, who calmly walked towards Hogan, who looked better than Volstig and Fandral. How was it down there? Must have been hard and painful, for them I mean. Hogan commented as he saw Thor fell a tree to use as a stool. Thor answered nonchalantly, looking fine except for the dirt and soot all over his body. I cleared the valleys and the mountains three lakes over. They are nothing but charred crisp and ashes at this point. You guys don't look too bad yourself. And there was the boasting streak that Thor oh so much loved. It wasn't as worse as it had been for as long Hogan could remember before his short-lived exile but it still came out every once in a while. They look like they are about to grant each other company to the great banquet. That's how good they are. Hogan softly whispered which Thor heard, but only smiled and said nothing else. Why did you think to send Sif with those Midgardians? It would have been better than a reliable guide and a Sif's strength to help hold out longer. He mostly silent warrior asked his friend and future king. Thor looked up at the sky, as if trying to peer through the clouds to see space's perpetual star-filled night. I'd go with them if not for my duties, and sending someone who can power up to vision and wander to a respectable degree, and capable of aiding them in the event of a fight, is the best I could do without going myself. Thor simply said without putting much thought to it. By now, Volstig and Fandral were silently listening to Thor's words, and it certainly pricked a peculiar way, even if they didn't mind all that much. You doubt Sif, your oldest friend and sworn sword. You doubt her strength and capability in measuring up to them. It was Fandral who asked, flabbergasted at what he perceived as Thor severely downgrading Sif's strength, who was arguably the strongest amongst them Thor excluded. Ha 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 ha, their display against the flame demons in Gorag certainly was a spectacular sight. I doubt Thor would so blatantly doubt our strength, except if they are true. Volstig fell into a violent coughing fit that he quickly got under control. Thor laughed at Volstig's misfortune, but affirmed his words nonetheless. Vision is strong. How strong I have no idea of, but he is more than capable fighting me blow for blow. Wanda and Petro were a lot weaker when I left them with Vision, who had promised to keep them safe, and now one is an established sorceress, that even Mother wants her under her tutelage. Ha 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 ha, when even Loki had begged for it. As for Petro, though the obvious weakest, his speed is slowly but steadily reaching that of a divine god of speed. Thor closed and opened fists a few times, 
and for the first time doubted the rate at which he grew stronger. There were thousands of races out there in the stars who lived not a tenth of the average Asgardian, yet produced warriors and fighters. That could give the average Asgardian and even some of the elites an equal battle, despite being younger and less experienced. I understand you. 4. Volstig's voice broke the prince out of his inner musings. Complacency is the greatest enemy that every warrior falls to. And that is what a longer life leads to most times that not. Maybe this is good, maybe not, but one single fact prevails. We lose if we are weaker, we are victorious only when we are stronger. With a heavy grunt and a monstrous force that caused the ground below him to spread meter white cracks, the gigantic Asgardian pushed himself up and hoisted up his great axe. I, Hogan, Fandral. The prince you swore your oath of arms to just called your century-old prowess in combat, weak in comparison to Midgardians who haven't even lived past their third decade. The equivalent of an Asgardian child in his wee youth. I'll swing my axe through you if you continue resting against the ground. The ground is only a place of rest for the dead and homeless. Though they were not the ones being addressed, the nearby warriors who too had been resting, pushed themselves off their support and gripped tight their weapons, standing ramrod with a straight spine. The battle spirit of an Asgardian is said to a mortal, burning so bright that not even the shadows of death can stop it, as its fiery blaze remains alit, burning as a beacon as it searches for its fellow comrades of battle, until it arrives in the great halls of Valhalla where it rests, wines and dines with legendary Asgardian warriors, until the horn of battle is once again sounded. All it needs to be an eternally burning flame is something to kindle it from a warm comforting wisp to a blazing inferno, that not even Helheim's deathly frigid winds can snuff it out. How could Autumn be one of the mightiest gods to ever exist since the first light, and go on to win 10,000 wars, and conquer the Nine Realms, if he ruled over normal people? Literally seeing the resolve of his people burning bright before his eyes as their future king. It was his duty to make sure they never lose the burning flames of passion in their hearts. Heimdall, the son of Odin and god of the sky, raised his voice in a great shout. That turned the bright day sky to looming darkness. Until our last strength leave our bosoms and we collapse of exhaustion. I order you not to withdraw is from the battles ahead. The world fell silent. The wind ceased to move. The animals and forest critters released no sound, fearing they might lose their life if they did. Under the dark clouds, Thor and his warriors remained staring at the sky, waiting, waiting and waiting, until it came. The riding stars of Asgard that could be seen all across the Nine Realms. The light of the Bifrost tore through the dark clouds, as it descended on the waiting warriors, taking them to battles that would only end until every last strength is sapped from their bones, is decreed by Thor Odinson. Asgard having been watching every single second of Thor's campaign since he stepped foot outside the Bifrost light, Heimdall, like the nigh eternal gatekeeper and watcher he was, bore witness to all the events that led to this moment. My king his voice rang directly in Odin's ears, and the Allfather's sights peered through the cosmos to gaze at Thor, as he gave Heimdall an imperial order the gatekeeper was duty bound to obey, unless Odin decides against it. He never got a reply from Odin, but the events that followed were all the answers they needed. Without Heimdall commanding it, the Bifrost light slowly came alive and shone through the stars, ignoring the physically untraversable distance, to shine its light on Thor. After that, the Bifrost turned off and a huge primordial rune that covered the whole dome came to life. Its function, to prevent the Bifrost from being turned on by any other person, Heimdall included, except the Allfather wills it. Seeing this, Heimdall sighed, his impassive gaze never leaving Thor's location, watching and waiting to witness the results of the resolve they threw at Odin's sights. How brash, this younger generation vision POV we ended up staying a few days, and despite how advanced this city was, its security couldn't completely prevent me from getting into a few places. I half entertained the thought of forcefully overriding this planet's AI security systems, but the consequences that came with stopped me from fancying those thoughts any further. Not when we stood to risk being branded as criminals of a power that spanned over 100 galaxies. It's not like our strength was invincible to them they had an impressive roster of powered individuals, not to mention their weapons. Ignoring those intrusive thoughts, I collected as much information as I could from the people I came across in these past few days. As far as I was concerned, apart from the two parties involved, no one had a concrete visual proof, if it had really been the time stone. But it had to be if everyone was so sure of it. Calculating probability ratio of the time stone being in Thanos' possession than Xander's. 54 colon 43 colon 3%. I'm guessing the 3% is the minuscule chance of it being in the hands of a third party. Affirmative with nothing else to do. 
It was time to permanently depart from this planet. From this point onwards we'll be us speedrunning the mission. It is strangely poetic how pressed for time we were, basically against a last minute clock, in retrieving the time stone. We'll be doing a series of jumps from here on, and also split into two two-man cells to increase speed and overall efficiency, once we start actively searching for the stone. We were currently in space, basically the end point of our space exploration tutorial, as I gave the rough outline of our actions going forward. Sif and I will be heading in Thanos' possible direction, while Petro and Wanda will be dealing with the Xander's front. Won't it be better to go with Sis when facing Thanos? It'll be hard to find people who can easily overpower the both of you, so why not? At least he was sensible not to make an obscene joke at this juncture. I expected a question like this, so I easily explained the logical reasoning behind my decision. If I tag you and Sif together, no offense Sif. But you'll be captured in no time if they find a way to deal with Petro, as his basic abilities are as straightforward as can be. I paused, noting that Sif didn't show any immature outbursts at being called weak, and continued. If I pair her with Wanda, though the versatility of Wanda's magic can compensate for most things you might face, against a moderately strong and large force, Sif's efficiency will be reduced, as Wanda will naturally take the brunt of it. Meaning Wanda's focus will mostly be on fighting back the enemy's stronger fighters once more making Sif an easier target to take care of. Do also note that these scenarios are me basing the enemy forces being equal or stronger than us, with them also having the number and terrain advantage. I can see that Sif is angry at me blatantly calling her a liability in higher level battles. A bit harsh on my part, but all I speak are facts. I don't have the problem of using emotions when making important decisions like everybody else I know, so this is the unbiased and purely logical conclusion of our current matchup. I'm more flexible and versatile than you in wandering chaotic situations, and coupled with better decision-making skills and overall efficiency, pairing Sif with me is the only way to ring out her efficiency in the upcoming battles. As I finished, Petro awkwardly scratched the back of his head as his eyes wandered everywhere except in Sif's direction. Well, that's there was no reason to go that deep, you know. I would disagree. But that's unimportant right now. I've downloaded all the information you'll need going forward, and they'll be updated real-time with every situation you find yourselves in, ensuring maximum efficiency at every turn. Any questions? Why put us in Xander's direction while you Thanos? Just curious. Wanda asked. The chances of you dying upon capture by Xander's forces are lower, at least when compared to being captured by Thanos. I said. Wanda frowned a bit trying to keep worry and overprotectiveness at bay. And you think sending someone with an infinity stone in his direction is a good idea? She raised a valid concern, one I already put in consideration, when making the decision to split up. It is also a much needed crux if the stone is really in his possession. After that, a few questions were raised, and I answered all of them with pre-calculated ease. With a series of spatial jumps, we arrived at what was basically a space checkpoint where Wanda and Petro separated from us, by boarding one of the shrunken ships in my possession. As for how I came into possession of seven deep dive spacecrafts, well they don't call me the negotiator for nothing. You've been uncharacteristically quiet for some time now. I stated as if making a passing observatory remark. Sif breathed in and out, while tightly clenching the sword hanging off her waist. You did call my capabilities as a warrior lacking. Or what was the word you used? I think it's inefficient. Is this you complaining or a simple case coming to terms and accepting one's weakness? I'd say it's me accepting my weakness and having my warrior pride stunned from said weakness being casually pointed out. She said, somewhat calm. I see Dash, but that doesn't mean I will keep accepting it. Watch me, Simons, as I gradually cut down those weaknesses you spoke of. She loudly proclaimed, but I said nothing to either acknowledge or discredit her words. The upcoming fights would do just that. With Wanda and Petro, one of the reasons why Vision also sent Wanda and Petro in Xander's direction was because in the case of the Time Stone already in their possession, they might not have to fight at all. The Time Stone being secured under Xander's watch was one of the best alternatives to the multiple likely scenarios that could otherwise happen. If it turned out that it was already safely stored away, Wanda and Petro would then regroup with VISION after, stealing it of course, 
and decide whether or not they wanted to attack the Mad Titan. Maybe give him payback for the New York invasion. After going through rigorous security checkups and verifications, Wanda and her brother finally were allowed entry into Xander's airspace for landing. As their ship slowly descended, the two of them could already make out a few powered aliens, especially those flying, all part of the local force. So how are we doing this? Should we mind jack one of them or go 007 with swiping cards and impersonating officials? Petro asked. Wanda scoffed at how stupid the second part of his suggestion sounded. Unless you can hack their systems for our entire duration here, then no we are not impersonating a high enough government official with the clearance for the information we need. Petro shrugged. Vision's projected time frame didn't leave them room for exploring more options, and the stress for efficiency made them choose the best thing they had, caring little for the ensuing fallout. As they conversed around the framework of the plan they would act on, they heard a series of banging on their ship's hatch. Here goes nothing. After an adorable twin-exclusive handshake, the two of them opened the hatch and stepped out to meet the small group of waiting enforcers. I don't have to remind you that any business you conduct will be strictly monitored, and any instances of stirring up trouble will have asses collared up, do I? The presumed leader of the group asked. Sheesh man, you didn't have to come all the way over here just to tell us that. And yes, we'll be on our best behavior because we don't want Puzz Boots hounding our behinds all the way. Petro flipped off the enforcer and walked away from them with Wanda in tow. Got him, he whispered. Got him, she nodded. Vision POV unlike the twins' straightforward mission. We couldn't just make a pit stop on Thanos' shop, the Sanctuary too, and begin our mission. From the information I got from Thor concerning Thanos, it would seem that his flagship mostly resides in a hidden pocket space, whose coordinates are known to but a few of the Mad Titan's most trusted subordinates, the Black Order. But the Black Order is not the only way for me to get to Thanos' ship, as I had another one two other ways to get, and that was the angle I was currently working out. Thankfully this universe wasn't strictly similar to the cinematics with varying changes, both big and small, while some remain the same. Peter Quill and his Guardians of the Galaxy which currently included Gamora, and the cybernetic implanted blue Luffamoid, Nebula, were my way to Thanos. My sights were Nebula rather than Gamora, as it's more efficient and less time consuming, as opposed to dealing slash reasoning with Gamora and the Guardians. Lucky for me, one of the info bits I acquired during a few days of extended vacation, contained her last sighting and the broker she made purchase with. A simple mind reading session and I'll have Nebula's location and then Thanos. The best thing about tracking down Nebula is that she was in a nearby star sector a few spatial jumps from Xander. The broker had no idea that someone was in his head, nor did he have a clue when I took away what he knew of Nebula's ship's data stamp and spatial coordinates, which I calculated and left him. As far as anyone was concerned, I was never there considering that the distance between me and the broker at any time was over a hundred meters even when I copy-pasted his memories. Don't worry, Sif. I'm sure you will get the fight you're reaching for. I said to the warrior woman who was feeling quite fed up with all the spy work I've been doing for the past hour. Nebula's action of hiding on a populated planet was a very smart choice. One near the capital of the Nova Empire, where she's a highly wanted criminal. But that made it easier for me covering the whole city in my telepathic wave. I shifted through the wavelengths of those with cybernetic implants and effortlessly singled her out. The moment we landed behind her disguised form, she reacted instantly and whipped out a blade, only to have her wrist hit with Sith's hand vambraces, which made her hold of the blade weaken. A twist, knee kick and head bash, later saw Nebula held against the ground under Sith. Unfortunately, this isn't a social visit. Silencing her shouts, I dived inside her mind, which was basically a database at this point, and started filtering the endless streams of data inside her head into catalogs. Assimilating and filtering new data log into already existing tags multiple identical data stamps found. Databank updated. Isn't that nice? Thanos security systems had similar security protocols as my Ultron. Better yet, it's based on the Ultron protocols, or at least a manually altered one. In other words, Thanos used the pseudo-sentient ego inside the Mind Stone to create a blueprint for his ship's security upgrade. However, unlike Stark, he only used it to enhance the already existing information he had rather than trying to rouse up the budding sentience by imprinting extinction-level protocols on it. This is a good find. I muttered before turning to Sif and signaling her to release Nebula who looked lightheaded and confused. What did you do to me? She asked, confused by why she wasn't in cuffs as a bounty to be collected, 
or even worse, being tossed back to her father's feet. I borrowed some information, though no longer accurate, but still something I can work with. From what I got from her, the coordinates must have been changed after she deserted, the same way it changed when Gamora had deserted. The only silver lining to what would have been bad news was that I had Ultron's original algorithm, and from it, I might be able to dig up the blueprints data of Thanos' ship. That must have been processed with the Mind Stone some time in the past. Adding that and Nebula's cybernetic base sequence together, I might be able to use the data scrounged off of it to calculate the new coordinates. What did you take from me? She took a step back in fear as the implications of my actions dawned on her, and fortunately for her, I needed nothing else from her. So I conveniently erased her memories and data of me and Sif. Did you manage to get everything you wanted? She asked as we quickly boarded our spaceship and shot off into a spatial tunnel. Yes. I curtly answered back as holographic screens appeared around me with different calculations running on them. Though how useful most of them will turn out to be still remains to be seen. I see. I guess that means a ship is currently heading in the Titan's location, isn't that right? A nod from me seemed to be the only confirmation she needed as she then sat quietly and started cleaning her sword. Calculating spatial coordinates right bracket codes upon codes ran through every part of my body. As I threw in all the data and processed information I had concerning space, and traveling through it into the equation that was coming alive in my head. Acting fast, I produced a few tubes of pin particles, and telekinetically placed them on different parts of the ship. I glanced at Sif and noticed how she didn't pay any attention to any of the ruckus I was creating. Focusing only on the things she could do at the moment, and trusting me to do mine. Here goes nothing. I muttered and covered the both of us in a hard light barrier, along with all other types of barriers I could use, stacked around the hard light in layers. I punched the spatial coordinates into the sheep, hoping it won't cause our ship to implode on itself. Might want to brace yourself for a bumpy ride. I warned. The mass of the ship increased multiple times over as it punched through an unauthorized space tunnel. While this was happening, I held onto Sif's shoulders for the next part which came soon after. As soon as our craft exited the other side of the coordinates it traveled through, everything around me slowed down to a crawl, as my mind registered the surrounding space. I could see minute cracks slowly appearing all over the ship, which was my cue to leave. Activating my quantum shifting, Sif and I decreased in size and disappeared just moments before the craft exploded. It was a calculated risk. But I might have underestimated the difficulty of breaking into pocket spaces by a few levels. By Odin. Where are we? Sif exclaimed at the change of location. A diminutive realm. We'll be shooting straight to the nearest ship so hold on. Telling her that? I maneuvered a bit and with another series of calculations to pinpoint my landing point. I expelled me and Sif from the quantum realm. And deftly used my phasing and light manipulation at the very moment our feet touched the ship to turn invisible and intangible ink as we landed in a crowded area. Looks like my luck is still rolling. I exhaled after registering that we spawned in an empty room. Where is this? Sif asked as we walked through the ship still in invisible mode. One of the nearby floating ships. Ours exploded to bits upon arrival which means they'll be cautious until they investigate how the ship came through without any prompt notice. I see. And we'll draw closer to the main ship in the meantime. She nodded in understanding and silently followed me until we arrived at the ship's cockpit still unseen. Mind jacking the four aliens commandeering this shop, I ordered them to return back to pod dock, and they absentmindedly carried my order, looking very natural as they did so. We did it three more times before we got to the main ship, and as soon as we did, I had to hijack the few alarm systems that easily caught our presence as we were only invisible. Our cover might be blown any moment from now, so get ready. I'm a warrior. I'm always ready for a fight. Any attempt at hacking their main systems will immediately trigger an alarm. Our goal is the Time Stone, if it is in Thanos' possession. To efficiently carry out the mission, I need to access their control room and manually force my way through. With it being the same as an alternate Ultron protocols, I should have an easier time assimilating and overriding it. Our bodies phased through the doors and floors as I made my way towards their control center, and from the information from one of the thousands of aliens on this ship, the control center was under the jurisdiction of one of the children of Thanos, Ebony Maul. Stopping before a cordoned hallway using energy fields, 
I frowned as the energy reading from them could affect my molecular deconstruction, and if I tried quantum shifting, the sensors here would definitely pick up the spatial fluctuations. Guess it's time to wave them hello. With a mental command, all the alien pilots I took control to get here exploded their ships docked inside the sanctuary too. Lifting the invisibility and phasing, I ignored all the sensors that immediately started monitoring us. I stood before the barrier and soon a dark orange energy ball formed on my fingertips and engulfed the entire hallway in a blinding explosion. Keep close. I reminded Sif who had her sword drawn out and was now cleaving through any enemy that was in the sword's path. Taking flight, I marked a rough path to the control center, and was about to go in that direction, when a giant hammerhead flew at me. But I caught it and broke it to pieces, only to have Sif attack Cull Obsidian's huge form, which he easier parried with his brace knuckles. Ebony Moore, mostly called the Moor by those who could say his name, snarled in anger as his body shook in profound fear, as he understood what was happening just a second after the explosions took place. It wasn't the thought of someone infiltrating the sanctuary that terrified him to no end, no. While that was an unimaginable failure on his part, what shook him to the core however was more. Dash the more immediately fell on his knees, as the face of his sire was projected up. If he could sweat, he would have been drenched in it as soon as the projection came on. His lord, master, and the true chosen, Thanos the mad titan. My imperial sire, this one has become unworthy in his negligence hand barbarians have infiltrated your castle. I am ashamed by the magnitude of my inefficaciousness, regret filled as I plead your magnanimity to allow me eviscerate these infidels. Before I carry out any punishment you deem right, I will lay down my life just to be grazed with the chance to correct my mistakes. The temperature in the room dropped several degrees below zero at the defeating silence as Thanos' eyes looked down on Ebony Moore. This will be your last disappointment, Moore. The projection flickered off with those last words of Thanos. But to Moore it felt as if he'd just lost his life's purpose, as his greatest fears were materialized. His father's disappointment. To Ebony Moore whose entire being was dedicated to faithfully serving Thanos and perfectly carrying out every order that left his mouth. The very act of earning his father's disappointment was the same as being thrown into an abyss of despair. Not just his mind, but his sense of self that worshipped Thanos with his very being shook in great rage, regret and fear. He stood up while grinding his teeth so hard that they would have sparked otherwise. Raising his head, he saw the shaking guards who were diligently carrying out their task, and the hollowing void he was feeling in his soil grew larger. Thud, thud, thud. A flick of his hand severed the heads of the six guards from their body, and only after that could he take a breath, although a very labored one. His eyes were bloodshot as he swiped the screen in front of him to identify those daring intruders and his anger peeked over the threshold when he saw that they were only two of them. The actions of two blind monkeys caused his father to express his disappointment for him. Listen, all you wastrels. Two intruders dared sully a lord's sanctuary, while you wallowed lazily in your negligence. Bring those intruders to the father's feet in the next ten minutes, or lose your heads alongside them. Though he spoke softly, his voice was carried to every corner of the ship, filling the hearts of tens of thousands of aliens and monsters with dreadful trepidation, and so they pounced towards where the intruders were, not caring if they stepped on one another. Vision POV Cull Obsidian was currently brandishing two axes against Sif, who was expertly parrying and counter-attacking the monster's greater strength, without losing any ground or momentum. Dealing with a black order and also with the increasing horde of outriders and foot soldiers at the same time, was no longer a show of strength, but of pure skill. Take care of that guy fast. There are more skillful warriors heading this way. I said as I punched a sound wave that blew the bodies of those in front of me apart. Cull Obsidian's only advantage over Sif was his greatest strength that were easily leagues above her own, which means she's more likely to expend more energy when fighting him than she should have. I waved my hand, and the path behind Sif that was now crawling with crazed monsters was sealed up. For however long it holds up that is. I left Sif there, a sumptuous bait for the crazed monsters that were now crawling in every corner of the ship. Initiating standby task. Assimilation and override of foreign systems may not notice task progression. Slowed down due to an unidentified external influence manual action is needed to complete the ongoing task. Assimilation and override the layout is shifting. Talk about upping the difficulty. Throwing away the live kebab I made, my telekinetic hold briefly halted Cull Obsidian's movements, which Sif capitalized on and cleanly severed his head with a clean arc that also killed those two close behind her. Thank you, she said after making quick work of the remaining Outriders and footmen. So, she noticed. 
I nodded at her while also taking note of the tiny invisible steam her body was releasing. I'm going straight for more. Do you dash leave this to me? Silence. Unless Thanos himself comes. I promise you that no one will get past me to the control center even if it costs me my last breath. Her voice was laced with a heavy conviction that I decided against saying anything to it. I started ripping apart metals and stones that stood in my way to more, while Sif followed closely behind. By using the rubbles I left in my wake as platforms to support her balance, while her sword weaved erratically and dissected any straggler unfortunate enough to come near her. Even while flying, I could feel the tremors that got slightly stronger, with every passing second as a literal sea of blood-starved monsters continued making their way towards us. First, take care of more and acquire the ship's main at control. Second, face a time stone wielding Thanos and win. I increased my speed towards the control center, leaving Sif in the dust until she disappeared, while blasting through anything that came in between my straight paved trajectory. Energy blasters and turrets tried slowing me down, but they had zero effects on me, and exploded into bits as I zoomed past them towards the control center, finally in my sights, only for some long strange crystals to fly at me. They easily pierced through my magnetic and hard light barrier, when I tried flying past them, forcing me to slow down a bit to dodge them, but never fully stopping. I felt Moore's telekinetic wave burst out from the room. He slowly started making his way outside in calm gated steps. Hear me, mongrel dash boom. A terrifying explosion engulfed the live action Squidward, effectively ending his life, before he could give any of his crazed fanatic speech. I stepped inside the control center and looked at what remained of Thanos' most dangerous child. Less than 15% of his body was still anatomically attached, with most of it being his head, and lifted him towards me and grabbed his head, that I specifically tried leaving intact. Unlike what I normally do, i.e. copying the memories I need, I completely swallowed Moore's mind, ego, memories and all, and locked it inside the mind stone, until everything was over. I don't know if I should be impressed or livid at what you've done to my home. I heard a deep calm voice behind me, and turned to welcome my guest, after flinging Moore's remains to the side. Thanos. It was more of a definitive observation than actually observing the giant of a titan that was well over a head taller than the Hulk, and just as muscular. Hum, you know me, but I don't know you. He was decked in armor, and his hand held the same double-ended blade you remember him using in the cinematics. Vision, I said. Vision, huh? How ironic. He chuckled as if hearing a joke no one else did. I reckon they call you a hero where you are from. Vision fates foretelling of a promised future. Good and bad alike, all in equal measure. But I guess they call you Vision because they feel you're the good part, almost as if believing that there is no bad part in their poorly delusional need to hold up a righteous hero above their heads, only to then turn around and martyr him, when he grows too big to control. And yet, they call me Dash, a tyrant. I said, both of us taking our time as we sized up the other. The laugh he gave at that almost sounded like a sad one. Almost. The mad titan they called me. He looked at me as if he wanted my genuine answer on the question he asked next. Tell me, why do they call you a hero, and me a villain, when all you do is what they want for calling you a hero, to please them, while they call me mad and a tyrant, when I only do what is necessary, to ensure they continue surviving. Tell me, why? Regular Thanos issues. I absolutely have no idea. But maybe it wouldn't hurt figuring out what this version's deal is. But even if I wanted to answer the question, it wasn't like it was an easy one. Thanos, on the other hand, patiently waited for me to arrive at my own well-thought-out answer. And mine was this. Good and bad both exist in a very delicate balance, easily swayed by the slightest action we make. With that in mind, I think it ultimately boils down to perception. Since everyone is intrinsically capable of good and bad, and can tell the difference between the two of them, the defining point becomes how people react to your actions tipping the scale. Since everyone knows a good act and a bad act, if more people accept your actions, calling it good and tilting the scales heavily to the good side, I think it's then safe to say that your actions are good ones the correct ones. We both remained silent after that until a soft whisper from Thanos broke the tender quiet. I see. With Wanda and Petro, Xander compared to Vision and Sif who were fighting against an entire planetary force inside their own gargantuan-sized ship. The situation on Wanda and Petro's side of the mission had been going swimmingly well so far. After ensnaring the group that gave them a warning to behave, they started draining all the important information from them until they had nothing else to offer, and so Wanda moved from them to their commander. 
The bad thing about Xander was that most of their forces, especially those inside the planet, were androids which made Wanda's flexibility in finding targets to ensnare very rigid and taut, but she managed and came across something. The Skrull and the Kree, both alien species had already invaded Xander, with the goal being the Infinity Stone. Things just got more complicated, right? Petro asked Wanda who only groaned and remained silent. Worst part is that we have no idea which of them is with the Time Stone. We can rule out the Skrull since they are a divided power. But that leaves the Kree, Nova and Thanos unaccounted for. I've already updated this on the new development. As for what we need to do now up for a little breaking and entering. They both grinned at that, finally having space to be a little more exitive with their abilities. Vision POV Thanos regarded me with a cautious gaze not knowing I was just seconds away from taking over his entire fleet. A nice addition to my collection if I might say. I've been scanning him since the moment he came into my range, but the feedback registered no object with the same wavelength as that of an Infinity Stone. Where's the Infinity Stone? I asked. Assimilation and override of foreign system main it. 98.73% completed anytime now. Of course, that's why you would come here. Brave. A foolish endeavor but nonetheless brave. He readied his blade at me and got in a low stance. Now you might ask, how quickly can I defeat someone stronger than the current Hulk? Task completed assimilation and override of foreign system made it completed compiled data that spanned every nook and cranny of the sanctuary too, appeared in my mind, and with it was the chamber where the time stone was kept. In the same moment, Thanos lunged at me with a speed that betrayed his humongous size, only to freeze to a halt after his third step. And this was the answer to the above question. Quite easily, yellow laser beams left my eyes and bored into Thanos' eyes, melting his brain to a boiling goo. Honestly, Wanda was a harder opponent to deal with than a gauntletless Thanos. Seeing the way I easily killed Thanos reminded me why I always use my abilities with restraints. I could solo the ship on my own, but I carried Sif along just calls, even going as far as using Thanos' army as some sort of training simulation for her. With the spatial points of every part of the ship in my head, I teleported the box containing the time stone to my palms and stored it inside one of my pocket spaces. So Thanos couldn't use the time stone because he couldn't control the energy from the stone. That makes sense. He wasn't versed in energy manipulation like Master Sorcerers, nor did he have the gauntlet to serve as a crutch or the space stone to act as a limiter for the time stone. Time is a fickle thing after all. Now, time to clear house. Might as well exert myself a little bit. My telepathic wave covered every corner of the ship, and tagged every single living thing inside the ship, excluding Sith. Every movement on the ship seized as they all fell under my hold, before collapsing one after the other like puppets on loose strings. I had increased the processing speed of their brains by a large magnitude that the electricity it produced fried their brains, and exploded it to mush. Any remark on that? Sh conclusion. Over Kilk, yeah. Thought so. I spied Sif through the surveillance systems, and saw how shaken she looked after watching everything around her drop to their death in a split second. Definitely overkill. But why stop there? Taking control of all the bodies once more, I opened all the doors on the ship and started gathering them in one place. I quantum shifted to the gathering ground and started shrinking the growing giant ball of bodies, which took a few minutes as I gathered every corpse on the ship to this spot and shrunk them down to the size of a basketball before throwing it into the quantum realm. A snap of my finger and Sif appeared in front of me with her sword drawn to my throat in a sharp reflex. Simons. By the gods, what an Odin's name was that? She half screamed with a shaken voice as she took back her sword. Did you, did you kill everything on the ship? I nodded. That I did. And with it, this mission is over. We're going back to Xander. She could only mumble dumbly trying to contemplate what the hell it was that she just witnessed. She said nothing even when I teleported us to one of the smaller space pods and spent a few seconds shrinking Thanos' ginormous space cruiser before going back to Xander. With the recent update I received from Wanda, it looked like things would have been a lot more bloody had the stone not been with Thanos. Probably a war would have ensued on Xander just because of the stone. So that's it. Petro whined at how quick the mission came to an end in a very anticlimactic way. This was a retrieval mission. What else did you expect? I asked rhetorically. We just picked up the siblings and are currently just cruising through space, heading to an uninhabited planet where the Bifrus would kick us up. 
You can't blame me for expecting a free-for-all planetary brawl slash invasion for the time stone. A man can dream, you know. He remarked lazily. Hey Sith, what's up? You've been awfully quiet since you came back. Wanda called out to Sith. I don't think it was the display of strength that shocked her. No way it could be. Rather, I think it's the ease at which I killed all of them that had her in her thoughts. With what I know of her, my bet says she's thinking of how to defend against something like that. Sith. Wanda called out again and hit her focus this time. What are you thinking about? Nothing. It's it's just the stunning display of might from Simon's back on Thanos' ship. That has had me in awe ever since, she said. They fell into their little conversation while I tabulated my gains from this little mission even as we landed and were beamed up back to Asgard. Welcome back to Asgard. Heimdall said upon our arrival at the Dome. The prince has been informed of your arrival. Thor met us halfway with his usual boisterous cheer, and then a banquet followed till the next day, before we could retire to our rooms. Are you sure you want to hold on to the stone? Doing so would make Megad a target you know. Except no one knows that I have the time stone. Hell, as far as the universe is concerned, the time is either with Thanos or the Nova Empire. And besides, it is not as if Earth is any safe considering that we currently hold two of the Infinity Stones. Thor and I were having a discussion about if it was wise for me to wield the Time Stone, along with the Mind Stone. If it was anybody else, even the other Avengers. I doubt Thor would just leave them with an Infinity Stone. The reason he was hearing me out and considering my words were because of two things. First being that he was the one who made my vision's inception possible, and the other being I could lift his hammer. I guess your words do hold truth, just as long as you keep it away from Stark and Banner's hands. He said half-jokingly. You don't have to worry about that. He really didn't because the last thing I want is Tony figuring out how the concept of time works and harnessing the energy into his suit. It would be a Kang scenario all over again. But these were the least of my worries. With Surta re-emerging, telling the coming of Ragnarok, it also meant that Hela was coming. Not the movie version, but quite possibly an established goddess of death. Thor as a trusted comrade in arms of mine, while I do not wish for it, and if truly Ragnarok is coming, I hope you'll call on us to help you fight, just like you helped us. Thor laughed and thumped his chest. Have no fear, Vision, for if truly Ragnarok comes, I'll beat it back with my hammer. His every word was laced with utmost confidence. But I however shook my head. No man can win a war on his own, Thor. Not that I doubt the might of Asgard and its people. I just want you to know that there are people willing to go to war for you, despite not being a Asgardian. We exchanged a look after which he slowly nodded and extended his hand for a warrior's shake. I'll try to keep in touch. With that, we were ready to go back to Earth. This almost felt like a vacation. Almost. We were beamed back to Earth without much fanfare except a mild sending off from Thor. Even though I could produce a 3D projection of the inner dome of the Bifrost, I was nowhere close to deciphering the primordial runes etched into the very structure. It would require an odd and level of knowledge of runes to recreate the Bifrost. But thankfully, with the spatial coordinates I assimilated from the logs of Thanos' ship, I'll soon be able to quantum shift across galaxies. Hum, where's everyone? And why is smoke coming from the compound? Wanda pointed out as soon as the scenery around us turned familiar. I sighed exasperatedly as I soon understood what was happening. Let's go. Doom is attacking the Avengers. I said as I flew towards where Doom was holding the Ant-Man by his neck while stepping on the Falcon's downed form. His eyes contracted as Scott and Sam's bodies disappeared from his grasp and were directly beamed up to the Overwatch's medbay. Looks like I'm finding more uses for quantum shifting. It's basically teleportation and translocation at this point. I idly mused and waved my hands only for Doom to get pummeled into the ground by a fist construct that appeared directly above him. Seriously, why is Banner always exempt or incapacitated during important fights? Poor guy was hit with a spell before he could even hulk out. Petro, help start clear out the troops of Doombits. I informed the speedster calmly even as a car passed through me. Wonder, Celine has ensnared Steve and Jelena. Try holding her back while I round up with Doom. After giving out those orders, I finally turned around to face Doom, who now wielded six pairs of magic circles around his hands. And here I thought we had an understanding, your highness. Why then the sudden hostility? I asked as I floated closer to him. The Infinity Stone and Doom gives you his words to seize the attack. 
he said. I could already hear Wanda and Celine going crazy with their magic spells in the background. And I remember telling you that I can't, under no circumstances, give you the stone. I stressed out, knowing fully well how futile it was. A shame. He appeared on my side, and magic binds immediately shot out to bind me, only for them to crash against the force field barrier I had put up. I threw a casual punch at Doom, but my hand easily went through his armored body. That was now glowing with patterns of a magic circle, while the real Doom appeared behind me and activated a pair of magic circles around his hands. That instantly turned two worn-out bandages that were quickly wrapping around my other arm. Ceiling. Not quite, but I know he's definitely suppressing something. Unlike what he might have been expecting, I wasn't worried about what he was trying to do. I might not be a master of the arts, but I'm not ignorant of it. With a little tug on the Mind Stone, Doom's magic broke apart into motes of light. Magic was just another facet of energy manipulation, that's why at a high enough point of it, it becomes hard to distinguish it from science. Enough playing around. He tried flicking to another location, but I already had the entire compound in a 360 degrees view. So I immediately noted his movements, and my hand extended faster than a bullet, and grabbed him. I didn't give him the chance to speak as I teleported the both of us to the clouds, where the clouds were slowly getting darker. A single spark of electricity was all that was needed for the world to turn white, as lightning struck us without remorse. With the electromagnetic spectrum of my abilities, I kept fumbling with the growing charges of lightning in the clouds, increasing it to the point that all the clouds around us had lightning bubbling around us. A second spark of electricity and the deafening sound of thunder assaulted our ears as I drowned Doom in a literal ball of lightning. Would have been better had you started with the mirror dimension. I remarked as I threw Doom's spasming body to the ground in cuffs and shot towards where Selene and Wanda were duking it out. Seriously. I muttered irritably as I saw Selene occasionally summoning Steve and Jelena to her vicinity, forcing Wanda to tone down on her output, which made it all the more harder for Wanda to keep up with the Dark Priestess. Petro Dash, on it, the speedster got the two compromise fighters, and beamed them up to Overwatch. Natasha and Laura fall back now. They didn't hesitate and quickly beamed back up to the Overwatch. I cocked my fist and increased its density by magnitudes, increasing the strength of my heart physique, by an ungodly factor. Tearing through the flimsy sound barrier like tissue paper, my form shrunk down to an ant's size, further boosting the density due to the compression of my body mass. As I shot towards an obvious Selene, and brought down my hand from the top of her head, one punch, and Selene's body exploded into a shower of blood and gore, while the entire area around her exploded with her, leaving only a 100 meter deep hole. After the dust cleared off. Pissed off much. She's annoying as hell. That's another thing we can both agree on. But are you sure she's really dead? I shrugged. Even if she's not dead, which is very likely. I doubt she'll walk that off with a shrug. If she's still not dead, she's halfway there with that punch. I shifted out of my hero costume back to my human form and beamed us back to the Overwatch. You couldn't have come at a more better time, Vision. Morgana out there was handling our asses to us after she couldn't find you. Tony, now out of his suit, made the first comment upon our arrival. Me? Why? I asked confusedly. Wasn't she more interested in Wanda? How would I know? You just had to stick it in the craziest one you could find, uh. He joked as we arrived at the medbay. Diagnosis. The theta and delta waves have been heavily impacted, and almost warped in its reverberating pattern caution. Extreme care is advised when trying to repair their brain waves. The diagnosis was heard by everybody inside the bay, so we automatically turned to the resident expert at manipulating brain waves wonder. While I could use the Mind Stone, or even my own telepathy to tweak them back to normal, the nature of Wanda's chaos magic was the best natural solution, most especially when the Mind Jack was done by black magic. So, Doom. I turned to Natasha and asked after we left Wanda to do her thing. Yeah, that was a clusterfuck and a half. He outright demanded the Infinity Stone, and started attacking when we refused. We had thought it was only him. But who would have thought Selene would partner up with someone like Doom? Like you saw, the result wasn't pretty. She said, giving me a brief summary of what had transpired and led to the present situation. I scratched my head irritably, followed by a tired groan. I left for just a few days, and everything almost turned to shit. Almost. She repeated before changing the progressively bleak topic. So how was your unplanned trip? Well now it was my turn to fill her in on what happened from the time we got accidentally beamed up to a besieged planet, where we fought flaming demons from Hellfire. 
before we met up with Thor. It then went to our days in Asgard before swiftly moving to our little adventure traveling through the galaxies of outer space. At this point, Natasha was already regretting on the mischance of a space mission. Kill Thanos. The big bad, along with his entire army, retrieved the Time Stone and made our way back here without anybody knowing what we did to Thanos' empire. That's basically it. Wow, sounds like a hell of a time you guys had. Thankfully you're back, she said. But I was here the entire time. I was. From the moment we left, my consciousness woke up in one of my prototype skins. So technically, and quite literally also, I never left. However, she shook her head. Hearing you talk through a scrap robot replacement and seeing you in your main body are two entirely different things. How did things flip this fast for how many days we were gone? If someone is to ever ask me this question, the only answer I can give is Marvel. Blitzing Celine had been the right choice. But now the problem is what am I going to do with Doom? Honestly, I don't have anything against the Jude. Rather than killing him, I'd rather have him as an ally or a passive neutral party in all things concerning the Avengers. That and the political shitstorm for killing the monarch of a nation. Stupid reason, yes. But doing otherwise will be stepping over a few lines that even the everyday people will find it hard to look over. I'm really not in the mood for this. Though I say that, I already have a line of action planned out. You say that as if anyone is in the mood for a villain attack. Ugh, my head hurts. Banner said while holding a bag of ice to his head. I hate magic. Sorry, big guy. Stark patted him on his back before choosing to address the main matter at hand. You all know we can't take drastic actions against Doom, right? Some groaned, some looked almost pissed off, while others just took it as it is. Why? Can't we just throw him in the raft or something? Some, like Scott, were vocal with their thoughts. The raft is kind of like the government's strongest containment unit reserved for the most dangerously powered individuals to ever walk the planet, so it's up to them who they want to throw into it. Stark's reply elicited some more groans of annoyance. Scott is rather ignorant of most of the government's inner workings, which made him more confused as he saw nobody really being vocal for sticking it to doom. The guy attacked the Avengers' home base with a witch and thrashed the home team might I had. How does that not make him raft approved in every way? Yeah, no one wants you to point out the obvious. Thank you. Sam said, his irritation displayed on his face for all to see. Well, I'd rather keep it brief with him. I said. Stark looked at me as if saying really. Really. I don't think he's open to talks at this point. And why should we? He attacked us. To that I can only shrug. Then we can only turn him to the authorities or hold him there. Indefinitely. We are not exactly a judiciary system in case any of you haven't realized. Maybe I should divert more time in building that special prison it's a good idea. But not really important at this point unless we plan to hold them forever or try to rehabilitate them. Scott looked at me in disbelief. Say something like us letting him go and I swear I'll punch you in the face, man, robot, whatever. Unless you want us to hold him here for however long we want, give him to the government we will no doubt let him go. Or kill him ourselves, yeah. At the end of it all, we'll let him go whether we want to or not. I simply said, they never really made it clear. But this hero thing is a whole lot more complicated than it looks on panels and screens. It also puts in a lot of perspective why the Justice League never kills their criminals. I kill, yes. But I don't make it a point to end the life of every criminal I come across. Kill too much and you're a tyrant regardless of how noble or right your reason might be. Kill in broad daylight and public view. Occasionally at that, and you're a vigilante no matter what. At the end of the day, heroes don't kill, full stop. No more context needed. But the funny thing is how no one talks about the casualties some heroes commit when fighting. Honestly, I'm up for whatever you all decide to do with Doom. While I prefer his brilliant mind aiding us, his obsession with the Mind Stone nullifies all that. I said, if the attack had happened in a civilian space, the restraint on our actions towards him would have been a lot different. Well, even if we can't just go around killing everyone that attacks us, we can't just let them go this easy after all, Natasha said, speaking up for the first time. Well, the government can hold him for a few months, maybe even a year or two Dash Banner started. 
but I interjected him. If he didn't have magic, the groans that came after I spoke were louder than before. Ugh, so what do we do to him? We've never really dealt with magic before you know. Stark murmured. Simple, have Cap decide. I said, the most efficient decision in my opinion. It's a pretty surprising thing that I have spaceships that are more than capable enough in conquering planets, multiple, at once. Thanos really was a threat. I think the only reason Carol Danvers didn't go after him is because, well nobody knows how to get to him. Hidden spatial coordinates and pocket spaces are the best way to hide in any universe. And even someone like Captain Marvel needs to know where her enemy is to fight them. The hidden pocket space he resided in was the only reason he didn't meet his end when he first started his genocide campaign. Got any plans for all this? Banner and Stark who were with me were having a field time going through some of the blueprints I acquired. Obviously, with the amount of information I currently have, Earth's technology will advance by at least 50 years in the next five years on all fronts. From something as small as a mobile phone to important things like medical equipment and vehicles, they are all bound to change. I guess I'll be telling Pepper to draft a bonus increase for the engineers for the next few months. Stuck said and we laughed. We could call in some people in this Tony. I mean, it's technological advancement in very aspect. We could get Cho, Frost, even Hank on this. Banner said, looking more excited at this than he's ever been with the Hulk. I guess scientists being crazy in the head have some truth to it. What will you be focusing on then, Vision? The excited doctor asked me. Me. Deep space travel mostly, among other things. I said and the room fell to pin drop silence. Multitasking for the win. I guess. Unfortunately for them, they can't think of everything at once, no matter how brilliant they both are. They'll probably join in at some point, but not anytime soon, given the numerous technical projects flying around the room. In an empty alleyway, a portal opened up with sparks flying around, while a person shot out of it, and crashed against the nearby wall. The portal disappeared in a flash of light, immediately after ejecting the person it just threw out, returning the alleyway to its natural silence. Ugh, that hurts. The person, a man, pushed himself off the ground and looked around where he was. Tapping on a band around his wrist, he said, Access today's public papers. I need to know where, or when, I am. Highlight any notable news while at it. The device chimed, and after a few seconds, it projected a few images to the man who quickly read through it with a slight frown on his face. The Avengers. That can't be anything good. Based on the dead alone, I can already tell this isn't the past, not mine at least. The man muttered. He walked into the city, easily blending into it with a changed outfit, as he looked up a few things on his phone. I have a few names. But who knows if they are any good here. A wild goose chase at best and drawing attention at worst. He put his hands into his pockets and pulled out a cigarette pack and lit one up, only to throw it away after taking a few puffs from it. After he was left with the ultimate task of deciding what to do with their new prisoner, Steve said nothing, and just made his way to where Doom was kept, after having been healed up by Wanda. The headache will probably stay for a few days, but other than that you're fine. Wanda said after seeing him massaging his head a few times. He nodded cursing magic with a few censored words in his mind. Should I be asking what this is? When they got to Doom's temporary residence, Steve found the whole place glowing with magic circles, along with a few talismans slapped on the doors. Wanda chuckled awkwardly. It's the most I could do to prevent him from opening a portal or teleporting away. It'll also alert me in the event that he does manage to open a portal. Fair enough. Steve could only say, he would never understand why people ever called his shield cheating when things like magic existed. Wanda made a simple spell, and the wall of the room Doom was in became transparent. Victor Von Doom, I'm Steve Rogers and I want to talk to you. Boom. Screams of panic and terror sounded loudly as people ran for the safety of their lives, as chaos went alive all around them, with explosions and people being smashed through buildings. Who let the freak kids out to play? A man cursed in anger, except that the grin on his face as he pointed the alien tech on his hands at the mutant teens in front of him told another story. Can't you guys take a break? We were on a semi-vacation before you bastards had to interrupt it. Bobby shouted while continuously erecting a wall of eyes to protect him and the terrified civilians behind him. Feeling the barrage against his ice wall stop, he hurriedly led the people behind him to safety, before turning back to help his friends. Scott clicked his tongue in frustration upon seeing the guy he shot with his lasers standing up for the second time, with only bruises to show for it. The group they were currently clashing against had been escaping after robbing a bank and crashing a few police cars, 
when he and his friends decided to stop them only for it to turn out that they had alien tech. We have to get those weapons away from them first. He said, we kinda have to get closer for that to happen. You know Rogue's voice echoed in his head, and he could do nothing but shake his head. Their weapons were annoying and dangerous. Gene, the civilians. No one in a hundred meter radius. Bobby just led the last group to safety Scott finally sighed in relief. With the civilians gone and reinforcements on the way, they could all finally focus their attention on taking them down. Bobby, I need you to swap with me. My blasts aren't doing any good against this guy. More than happy to after I figure out how to get this guy off my ass the Iceman complained. So much for a field trip. Scott, Jean, Bobby and Rogue were on their school field trip before they got caught up in this shootout, meaning only the four of them were here to fight against the group of five armed robbers. Extra emphasis on armed. Treating the scenario in front of them as another one of the simulations they've run in the danger room. They slowly separated the group and steadily closed the distance between them while Bobby and Rogue did. With the regulators they hit from the Avengers during that political shitstorm, Rogue was able to use her abilities without outright putting those she used it on in catatonic states. She had swiftly copied Bobby's abilities before they jumped into the chaos, which only made the boy dizzy for a minute or two. With her manually regulating her abilities, she had to maintain contact for a few seconds to get a more comprehensive state of the ability she was copying. With the two ICE users backed by Jean and Scott, they targeted the looser members of the crew, and finally got to drop two of them, before the panicking leader pulled out a really fancy bomb, and threw it their way. Rogue, watch out. Jean shouted at her friend who was closest to the bomb's trajectory. Rogue frantically tried to put up a wall between her and the bomb, but before she could make it thick enough, a web string caught the bomb, and swung away from Rogue. Too close, too close. Peter, currently a Spider-Man, muttered to himself. He had to break from his school group on their field trip after they heard the explosions from blocks away. Luckily, their outing for the day was called off, and they were hurried back to their lodgings, which gave him a good window to hurry here. Are you okay? He asked the girl who was an X-Men and nearly got bombed. Rogue shakily nodded as he helped her up. She quickly realized that the barrier she hastily made wouldn't have completely saved her from the bomb after she saw the effect of it. Aren't you a little too far from New York? She asked after noticing how far the local hero was far from home. I was in the neighborhood. Can't be the neighborhood Spider-Man if I don't help out whenever I'm in a new neighborhood. Their chat had to be cut off with Peter swinging away after noticing that the robbers were turning tail. Not today. He said as he closed in on robbers who had their retreat actively slowed down by Scott and Bobby. Let's hope the prototype works. Peter commanded the built-in system of his suit, and it rolled out a marble from his web shooters which he decisively threw at the robbers. Yes, it works. He couldn't help but shout in excitement as he saw that the shrunken emp prototype that he had made work, as it had effectively disabled the weapons the robbers were using. Hey guys, I think we got off on the wrong foot. How about we properly introduce ourselves? Ham. They had the robbers quickly rounded up and in webs by the time the police arrived, where Peter had to remain behind as it seemed the others were in a hurry. They made sure to thank him for saving Rogue when he did before bolting. As soon as they heard the teacher supervising their trip was doing a head count, and was contemplating filing a missing persons report, if they were still unaccounted for in the next 10 minutes. Maybe I should have gotten their contacts so we can hang out sometimes. It's not like teen heroes are a common thing. Slow thinking there, Spider-Man. Peter thought, quickly regretting the mischance. Mr. Stark, come by the lab when you're back from your trip. Kid Vision found himself on Venus when he tried using the spatial coordinates of Earth's solar systems, in tandem with his quantum shifting to fine-tune any hiccups the method might have, and it did. From wanting to go to Mars, he had found himself on Venus instead. But he didn't worry. It was obvious that making sure the quantum points corresponded with the spatial points he had were going to be an issue over long distances. It was a given fact since he wasn't using a spaceship to move between the spatial points. Test 14. Failed information updated this is going to take some time. He thought as the space around him changed from the barren grounds of Venus to the familiar surroundings of the Overwatch. No problems coming back so far. Mostly because I'm familiar with Earth's spatial points and quantum points. 
After making some slight modifications to his calculations, he initiated another jump to Mars. But this time, like a few other times, he found himself in the cold vacuum of space. Hum, I'm just outside Mars' exosphere. And again he was gone. He found the idea of fine-tuning his way of universal traveling more important than working on the Time Stone. The reason Thanos didn't use the Time Stone and had it stored away was that he had no way of controlling the haphazard rate at which Cronin's time particles were released from the stone. The Titan had tested it against some of his soldiers, and the results differed from them turning to cultured cells, turning to dust, decaying bones, or outright disappearing, and he had no way of reversing it. All Vision hoped was that having the Mind Stone would allow him better wield the Time Stone, since they sort of acted as a balance to each other. After two more tries, he finally found himself standing on Mars' surface. Now, let's see if I'll be able to teleport to any location on Mars. Since he now had the general location figured out, the next thing was getting the smaller points sorted out. I'll be going to Pluto next after I'm done with Mars. I reckon if I can move accurately anywhere in this solar system, with the amount of data collected, the equation should be applicable to the rest of the spatial coordinates I have. And once again he was gone. Eric was mostly a content man with how things have been happening lately. The hate was still there. Humans don't change that quick. But the way forward has never been more clear. The challenges were there. But in the coming years, he was sure that seeing mutants openly working in public places wouldn't be that much of a strange thing. Maybe getting political positions was an impossibility now. They already had plans for that. They won't let the humans dictate how they will move forward, whether they like it or not. Who's there? Eric called out, frowning slightly at the unfamiliar presence he was sensing. It was very faint. But he didn't doubt his senses. You'll soon come to find that I don't like repeating myself. The room remained silent after that for a few seconds before it started shaking as long needle-thin pins floated behind Eric, all facing a particular direction. I see that you're still a prick here. That's a good thing I think. The man hiding in the direction the pins were pointing at disabled his illusion and regarded Eric with a wry smile while Eric regarded him with a confused frown. And you are? The man chuckled. Now that's a question I haven't heard in a while. Who's the new guy? Omni Sensei here. Thanks for following this series so far, dear viewer. I apologize for the cliffhanger, but this fanfic has either gone on a hiatus or is abandoned. If the author resumes this fic I will upload more parts. That's all for now. See you in the next one. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.